Okay, so good morning everyone and thanks for coming to my tutorial on modern time series analysis. Um, this is sort of my interpretation of modern time series analysis. I suppose everyone would have a different interpretation, but to me, mainly what that means is we're not gonna cover autoregressive models. We're gonna talk about them briefly and then we're gonna mainly talk about methods that are more computationally taxing. Uh, some of them were invented many decades ago, but I would still classify them as modern given that they've been far more successful sort of with the era of big data and far more successful with sort of readily available computing resources. But that doesn't necessarily mean the ideas are, are very new. But I mean, that's also true for even neural networks, right? The ideas are also not new. A lot of the modernity comes from the computing resources. So that's how we'll be thinking about this. Um, a little bit about me and my background in this subject. So a few years ago, I actually gave another tutorial on time series analysis at SciPy, um, and that one covered more exploratory data analysis, data processing, and also uh, more traditional methods like uh, ARIMA models, autoregressive models, that sort of thing. Uh, so if you're interested in that and you don't have a background, that is one resource of many resources. That's just the one that I've prepared. Um, you don't need to be familiar with that material for today, um, but it is definitely material you should be familiar with and um, that should really be your bread and butter if you are working with time series professionally. Even though those, uh, those methods are sort of low tech or less modern, um, they're very much relevant today. They still perform exceptionally well and they also give you a really good conceptual foundation. Um, and similarly, it's good to be comfortable with data cleaning of time series and all of that. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm also just a little bit curious about people in this room, so I guess I'll just do a quick survey. Uh, show of hands if you already work with time series data at work. Okay. Uh, I hope there will still be stuff for you. If not, uh, no hard feelings. Uh, and you can certainly pipe in with your own uh, suggestions and input as well. Um, and how many people have never worked with time series data? Okay. Or very limited. How about very limited? Okay, fair enough. And how many people work in a scientific sector, broadly defined? Okay, and how many people don't work in something you would call remotely scientific? Okay, fair enough, so good for me to know. And then just out of curiosity, who thinks they came the farthest to get here? Singapore. Can anybody beat Singapore? That's really tough. <coughs> yeah, that's okay. There was someone on my flight who claimed they'd been traveling for two days, but they didn't come to this conference. They might have you beat, though, <laughs> as far as, like, time or whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, just a very brief overview of sort of what makes time series data special, some things you want to keep in your head when you're looking at time series data, especially if you're new to it or haven't worked with it for a while. And then we're going to divide our discussion into three components. We're going to be looking at state space models for time series, just an overview of what those are, and we're going to cover two methods specific to uh, state, space me state space methods. We're going to talk a bit about applying traditional, mach traditional machine learning methods uh, specifically for time series and what approaches you can take there and what you want to look out for. And we're going to wrap up looking at some deep learning for time series. Okay, so time series generally. What are time series? It seems like everybody uh, has a good idea of what those are, given that you work with them, right? Uh, so the classic example, I think, in every time series book, almost always you will run into many, many examples of something like stock prices. They are readily available, uh, usually free, fairly chaotic time series, so they're really interesting to look at. And of course, nobody is all that good at modeling them, because if they were, they'd be filthy rich. So it remains sort of an open problem, which is also interesting. Um, but I want to point out that uh, many other things are time series that don't get called time series and even get an analyzed in their respective disciplines without anyone using that word, even though that's what they are. So on the upper right-hand corner of this slide, I have an EKG diagram. Um, I've never heard a doctor talk about time series data, but actually that's often what they're looking at, right? Uh, they are taking some sort of measurement over time. When you're hooked up to any device in the hospital, it has some kind of digital or analog curve. That's a time series, right? So um, I think data science or time series analysis or whatever you want to call it has a lot to contribute to this field. And while we keep hearing about um, 
the benefits of healthcare for, time, for, uh, for data science or deep learning. We don't hear about it so much in the time series context, even though there's actually a lot of time series data in the health field, as well as many others. Um, similarly, on the bottom, I think this is an NMR, but I might be wrong if a chemist wants to correct me and, and tell me this is some other kind of spectroscopy. But this is some kind of um, NMR looking at molecular structure, right? This is also a time series by my definition, even though here the uh, x-axis is not time. It's actually just wavelength. Ah, got a badge. Thank you. Um, because you can use many of the same methods on it, and what you have is you have a well-ordered, well-spaced temporal axis. Uh, so we are even going to be working with some data today where your temporal axis is not time per se, but it's something with this sort of well-ordered metric between different points in time, right? So that's what makes time series different from anything that's cross-sectional analysis. And here's an example. So what might I do with something like that, right? If I don't have time as an axis, am I really going to do prediction? Well, probably not, right? Prediction might not be the most useful thing, although maybe you can contrive an example. Um, but you can certainly do something like time series clustering, right? You might have multiple NMR spectra, and you want to find a way to classify them without having hundreds of grad students slaving over it, right? If you can find a way to replace those grad students, even better. OK, so tasks for time series analysis. What are things people do? Well, as usual, visualization and exploratory data analysis. Uh, when you do this for time series, often you have specific time-related temporal questions, such as understanding the temporal behavior of the data, especially if your time axis is actually a time axis, such as seasonality, right? Is there some kind of recurrence in your data, some kind of uh, seasonality? You can also look for cyclical data, not quite the, the same as seasonal data, right? So cyclical data uh, will have some sort of recurrence, but it can be damped, and it can also sort of change its period over time. So an example of seasonal uh, would be something like the weather, and an example of oh, an example of cyclical would be something like people hypothesize there's a business cycle, right? Some sort of boom and bust cycle in banking or stock prices, that sort of thing. Um, and what's another thing we usually want to do is sort of identify underlying distributions and the nature of the temporal processes producing the data, right? We want to get a sense of, I have a hypothesis that I see this sort of river level over time, and I want to get at sort of what describes that river level more fundamentally. That's another thing I might want to do, not just predict, but also have a way of describing the dynamics. Um, what else do we need to do? Well, we can do estimation of past, present, and future values, right? So there's also this distinction between, say, something like filtering and forecasting, or also smoothing. We'll talk about all of that in the context of state space. But the idea is, if you have noisy measurements, and you can think of all sorts of things as noisy measurements, such as stock prices, where maybe you think the market got it wrong, and there's a real price that's separate from what the market says. Or it could be a medical sensor that has some sort of known plus or minus. So let's say even if you measure your blood sugar within a minute on the same device, you will still have um, you know, a 5% discrepancy. And that's something that's actually accepted by the FDA right now uh, for devices used by people with diabetes. So there's an example of you, know, you can't get it perfect. And so you could have a time series with just lots of measurement error. So you can have tasks of figuring out, well, what was the true value at all these time steps? Right? There was a value I measured versus the value that is actually true. And is there a way of getting at that? Uh, next up, classification. That's another common uh, time series task. This could be both in something like the medical field, right? Can I classify what kind of EKG I'm looking at? Is this showing me normal heart or some kind of arrhythmia? This could be classification of NMR spectra, like we talked about. This could be classification of retail behavior. Do we have sort of distinctive trajectories through our website, right? Things like that can also be uh, time series analysis. And then another major task is anomaly detection, right? Can we figure out which points are the problematic points, right? And the better we can do that, the less often, say, a bank will have to cancel credit cards or uh, a doctor will have to run tests that weren't really necessary versus run the ones that we really need. We don't always think of these things as time series analysis. But increasingly, we have panel data for all these things, right? Increasingly, for things we think of as cross-sectional data, right, surveys or whatever, we're better able to track people, and so we have a sense of how things are evolving over time. OK. Time series data versus cross-sectional data. What are some of the challenges or things to keep in mind? Well, number one, there's more opportunities for missing data points. 
it can be quite challenging following the same people or even samples through time. And I imagine anyone who has worked, especially in sort of human-related sciences, knows about this problem, right? Good luck finding the same survey respondents year in and year out. That's sort of an epic task. Um, even for really simple scientific data, that can be a problem. For example, when I was putting together the data for this tutorial, um, I was trying to use some Colorado River data from the federal government, and I kept getting bombarded with this sort of bright red text indicating what measurements they had discontinued due to funding cuts, right? And so time series, especially anything that looks at government uh, data sets, is even affected by politics to some extent, which is kind of funny, right? You'll just run into it more than you might if you were just doing panel data. Um, second major point, there's a high degree of correlation between data points. Values in the past almost always, and we hope, predict values in the future, right? So you have to think about what your errors look like. You have to think about what your relation to points in time looks like, as opposed to correlations where um, cross-sectional data, where you tend to throw things in, and these are different people, and hopefully, to first order, they're not super correlated with one another. Um, so this is good for prediction, but it can be bad for models that assume independent inputs, right? So for example, when we are uh, looking at some machine learning techniques, or when we're thinking about how can I apply sort of non-time series statistics to time series analysis, uh, we might very readily violate the assumptions, whereas if we're sort of careless in general about running linear regression, that's not so likely to be true. Uh, it's very likely to be true in time series analysis. And then there's also just the, the hassle of dealing with timestamps or other measures of whatever your distance metric is along your temporal axis, right? You have things like time zones, frequency irregularities, and so on, even if you only work with um, sort of scientific data where things like the exact timestamp, like day of the week, doesn't matter because as far as I know, that doesn't affect physics. Um, you might somehow find that, for example, your timing measurement is a little bit off, right? You have some sort of bias problem, um, so it doesn't go away even in that case. Okay. Other characteristics. Data is collected sequentially. One axis is monotonically increasing, right? So as I mentioned, that's my definition of a time series. Uh, it's got to have a meaningful axis with measurable distance, it doesn't have to be time. We do want to characterize structure across data points, right? So again, seasonality and cycles, autocorrelation, and trends. Uh, who's familiar with the concept of autocorrelation? Just want to make sure that's fairly familiar. So just a quick overview for those who aren't. Autocorrelation is just how uh, a point at time t is correlated, say, with at the time t minus 1 for the entire time series, right? So at time t, how do I relate, like this value, how does it always relate to the value before it, right, in a probabilistic sense? That's uh, autocorrelation. And then finally, stochastic behavior, um, even as the behavioral regime, right? So in cross-sectional data, uh, we're used to thinking about, oh, if I see sort of qualitatively different behavior, I might be identifying sort of different subgroups in my population, right? Maybe I'm looking at two molecules or sort of two types of consumer or whatever. Uh, but in time series, you can just have within the same series some kind of stochastic shift to a different regime, and you need to think about how to identify that, that sort of change point identification. Okay, uh, here's a, a slide on autocorrelation, and in case anyone's not familiar with it, um, even if you are, I guess the main point I want to make is that you don't always know from eyeballing your data what it's going to look like, right? So we might think, oh, I'm, I'm just sort of looking at this top panel, I have a sense of how correlated these things are, but I personally, when I then look at the lower panels, um, this series is much more sort of self-correlated than, correlated than I would have thought from just looking at it, right? It looks kind of noisy, and maybe there's some kind of seasonality, but not to the extent then that I see with the ACF. So that can be good to keep in mind, too. Um, your data is never clean enough or never sort of noisy enough or white noise-like enough or, or beautiful enough that you should not run basic diagnostics. Okay, uh, special concerns for time series data, so correlated errors, right? And on the right-hand side, on the upper right-hand side, this is actually the errors or the residuals of a time series model. So at this point, I say already wrote a model that I thought accounted for the seasonality and the self-correlation, but what we can see is um, these blue lines give us the significance levels. You can see that this model actually is failing to describe all the autocorrelation of the time series, right? So this is something you need to keep in mind. For time series, there's special diagnostics you need to do that are time aware. In addition to having time aware modeling, we need to have time aware diagnostics. Cross validation um, also will usually look different in a time series context, right? So there I'll draw your attention to this uh, plot in the lower right hand corner. For cross validation, 
It depends on what you are modeling and the nature of your data, but often, if you are trying to predict the future, you want to make sure that future information does not leak backwards in time, influence your model, and make your model look a lot better than it does. That sounds like common sense, right? We're all professionals. We would never, ever do that, right? And yet, um, many people, myself included, will find themselves very embarrassed when something does much better um, in training and you think you properly cross-validated it and you roll it out to production, which is really the ground truth, um, and it doesn't. And so you can really never, ever, ever be careful enough about the cross-validation and the next bullet point, the look ahead. So one thing you can do, as is illustrated in this lower right-hand corner, is um, you sort of roll your training data and your testing data forward in time. And the idea is, is you never want to test on data that is in any way older than what you trained on, because you don't want information propagating backwards. That's another thing about time series and temporal axes. Most of the time, right, the information should really only propagate in one direction. You can write models that are the opposite, right? You can have causal time series, and you can have the opposite, where information goes backwards in time. That doesn't tend to be interesting for modeling, though, right? That doesn't tend to be the questions we're trying to answer at work or in research. Um, a few other notes on look ahead, right? So this is just for cross-validation. Just because you've covered this does not in any way mean uh, you've avoided look ahead. Just because you've properly cross-validated, there are all sorts of other things to keep in mind. Um, time stamping, right? Just because you have data available time stamped at a particular time as an input into your model doesn't mean that that time stamp reflects, say, when you would actually have that data, right? So you might have, uh, for example, Let's say you're trying to predict the jobs numbers, and you might have some sort of um, survey of how people are feeling, and you have the date of the survey when it was taken, but you forget that maybe it doesn't get input into the system available to you for a week. And that's the sort of thing that can happen when you move from research to production, is suddenly you realize that your inputs that you thought were available actually aren't, right? And maybe it took place in the past, but it hasn't been registered yet. So there's another example of look ahead. Um, there are many more, and as far as I know, there's not sort of an automated way to diagnose look ahead. You just have to really keep your eyes open, and it depends a lot on what your field is. And sometimes it's not even an issue, depending, again, on, on the field, uh, but especially tricky with human data. Okay, so uh, just brief overview. Any questions or comments or anything people with experience would want to throw in on top of that? I know, it's like 8.30 in the morning. Oh, yes, somebody does. My first introduction to time series analysis was all about understanding the frequency space, uh, important things like night plus frequency and sampling rates. Is that part of the modern time series analysis, or do you just kind of consider things in a statistical mm -hmm. sense? Only in a statistical sense. So I have no frequency domain uh, examples here, although I can speak about it briefly when we get to deep learning, because certainly there's a lot done there. Um, and that's a good thing to highlight, right? So there's a whole sort of other domain of time series analysis that looks at uh, time series in the frequency domain. Uh, very successful, especially in certain fields. Um, and actually, for those who are interested in a brief tutorial, I have that in my first tutorial posted. So that's a good point to raise. Yes? You uh, mentioned that uh, part of this uh, is, is dealing with missing data. Are, are you getting to imputation and, and how to no, I won't be discussing um, data imputation, although all of the methods we use can be applied to data imputation, so I'll, I'll make sure to comment on that as we go. But there are no examples. And that's, that's another, given uh, what I highlighted about the missing data, this can often be important. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about state, state space models. We'll start with some background on Box Jenkins' ARIMA modeling. Um, so ARIMA modeling, uh, if you haven't used it, you've probably at least seen this term, ARIMA, or maybe you've seen ARMA, or AR, or MA. You've seen, these are all sort of the same class of models, statistical models developed uh, a very long time ago at this point, uh, sort of early, early to mid 20th century. Um, as you can see, though, they can have, despite, you know, sort of being old, traditional, they have excellent performance, especially on small data sets. So here I have um, the example of the airline passenger data set, a very famous data set if you look at time series um, textbooks. This is always there. Um, you can see, so uh, the forecast versus the observed are pretty close, right? This is already pretty good. And so one of the interesting things about modern time series analysis, right, or sort of 
non-traditional methods, however you want to call them, is you always want to make sure that you are actually contributing something that you couldn't get, say, with an ARIMA model. And that is surprisingly difficult. Um, not just that, it's also surprisingly difficult sometimes for an ARIMA model to, build, to beat an even simpler model, which is just sort of your null model, could, which could be something like, I will predict for time t plus 1 the value I have at t, and just leave it at that. And that itself can be an extremely good model. Uh, so I just want to point out that we are starting with a fairly high bar, especially in certain domains, right? If you have uh, certain kinds of data sets that don't have too much noise or that have, say, a strong seasonal component, you can do very well with this sort of model. So what does an ARIMA model look like? Well, I um, just want to sh uh, show you sort of one way of thinking about it. If L is your lag operator, a lag operator means if I apply L to X sub T, X at time T, I get X at T minus 1. If I apply L squared to X sub T, I get X sub T minus 2, right? So it's just a way of expressing that we're moving something back in time. Um, in this case now, my alphas, my alpha sub I on the left-hand side, those are my autoregressive coefficients, and my thetas on my right-hand side are my moving average components. So this is sort of the traditional way to express an ARIMA model. It's some sort of, or this is an ARMA model, rather. It's some sort of, on the left, um, way of operating on the data itself. So this is going to have coefficients that apply to past values. And then on the right, you're going to have coefficients that apply to sort of past errors, right? And those could be noise in the system, stochastic noise. They could be measurement noise. You can interpret it in a number of ways. Um, but the idea is that your future value is in some way going to depend on your past values and your past errors. And what sort of values you choose for P and Q, your summation, are part of how you do your model tuning. Now, if you go to an ARIMA model, now you have all of that plus a difference. So all that means is you have this additional 1 minus L to the D, which means you're going to difference your time series. So that means instead of drawing my original time series, like my air passengers with the absolute number at each timestamp, I'm going to convert my time series for a first difference to the delta. So the time series becomes a series of delta, t, delta x's instead of x's, right? So you have the exact same information. You haven't lost any information except maybe your offset. Um, and what that does is it often converts your time series to a more tractable form. Maybe it won't have such differences in volatility over time. Maybe it won't have the trend. Maybe it will now be eligible for models to apply that wouldn't otherwise, right? For example, ARIMA needs stationary data. So often you're going to be differencing to get that stationary data. So that, that's the model. That's as much as I'm going to get into this model for those who don't know it yet. That all you sort of need to know is this describes future data in terms of past data and past errors. It's as simple as that. And I should also mention, fitting these things is not easy. Fitting these things can be a bit of an art, or it can be um, a matter of sort of um, optimizing your AKE information criterion, depending on who you talk to. There are sort of different schools of thought. Uh, but everyone agrees this is a fairly difficult problem. And it's easy to sort of overfit. It's easy to specify an overly complicated model and so on. And that's the sort of thing where you can then get embarrassed later when you roll it into production. And it turns out to not be as good as, as you thought it was. OK, so why are people um, not happy with ARIMA, despite, for example, this beautiful plot I showed you? Right? To me, this already seems pretty good. Right? I'd say, if I could get this on, on everything I'm trying to predict in the world, that's already you know, enough to buy a house or uh, buy some stocks or something like that. Um, but there's a lot, plenty of problems, right? So I think the first one you probably noticed as I took you through it is it's not especially intuitive, right? I just showed you this equation. The equation itself is a little confusing if you haven't worked with these sort of forever. But on top of that, when you get coefficients, that's also still kind of confusing, right? Um, what does it mean that, you know, x sub t minus 1, the coefficient is 0.3 or 0.7? I don't, like, what, what's the difference between the 0.3 and the 0.7? I don't really know. And especially when you have multiple inputs, right? So if I'm saying x sub t is going to be a function of x sub t minus 1, x sub t minus 2, x sub t minus 3, and they all have coefficients, then it really becomes kind of difficult to think about what that dynamic looks like. And you'll see this in time series textbooks. Mostly when they give you examples, they'll stick to something with just one or two inputs, right? So like an AR1 or 2 model, precisely because the, the more complicated it gets, the more difficult it gets to even think about where different behaviors are coming from. There's also no way to build in an underlying understanding about how it works, right? So especially if you come from a discipline with sort of a well-developed set of time series data, maybe people have been staring at it for five years 
or 100 years, right, depending on what discipline you're in, uh, usually there's some knowledge about that system, and there's also some theories people want to test, right? So they might even say, well, it's not enough to be able to predict or describe this model with some kind of dynamic um, that's A, R, M, I, whatever. That doesn't mean much to me, but I'm aware that, say, there's a random walk element to this kind of data. Or I'm aware that there's a cyclical element, which can't really be described with an arima. Or there are external regressors I'd like to include. And then you, know, you get into more complicated models, or you start looking for models that are a little bit intuitive. Um, also, some systems cycle more slowly or stochastically than can be easily described with an ARIMA model. So ARIMA models do really well with sort of short cycles, right? Maybe seven days on daily data, um, things like that. But when you're already even getting to sort of 24 hours in hourly data, ARIMA models can get really ugly. Um, and it's unlike machine learning where you sort of throw more data at it and you might get a better result. ARIMA models sort of level out. So they do really well with small data sets. Um, arguably, they still beat everything else because they're just, you can give it just a 40-point time series and it will do really well, and good luck doing that with a tree or a neural network. But on the other hand, when you give it 40,000 points instead of 40, it's not clear that you get much better performance. Okay. So enter structural time series. So these have been around for quite a while. Um, they're not new, but they're sort of much easier to implement than they used to be a few decades ago, right? You get much more computing power now, and what that means is you can have a way that's a little bit more intuitive of understanding your system. So here's an example of a model that has a level component and a seasonal component. And then there's a component they call irregular is just sort of everything else that can't be explained. That's sort of the error term we're going to end, add at the end. And so here, arguably, we already get a much better sense, right? So compare this, sorry to flip back, but compare this to that, right? This, I don't really have a sense of why my model's doing well or what's contributing to it, right? I can see that my model is describing the seasonal data. I could look at my coefficients from my ARIMA model and try to puzzle it out, but there might be quite a few of them, so it, it's difficult to see. Um, whereas here, I, I feel like I can look at this and say, well, you know, we have this underlying level that sort of stays uh, quite steady up until like sort of 83, and then it takes a dip. And I feel like I know a little bit more about what's going on, and I can possibly use this as supporting evidence for a hypothesis, um, or maybe evidence that goes against my hypothesis about how my data is behaving. So th these are how we use structural time series. Um, interesting thing, they can also be expressed in ARIMA form. So in a way, we're not actually doing anything novel. We're not actually, if you're going to be like sort of a very formal mathematician about it, we're not contributing anything new. But to my mind, we really are because we have a way of inspecting and enhancing sort of the human intelligence rather than the statistics. Um, these are fit via maximum likelihood or a Kalman filter, right? So you can have a, an MLE interpretation of that. You can have a Bayesian interpretation of that. Uh, interestingly, Kalman filters, again, not super modern. I believe they go back um, to the time of the Apollo mission. At least that's the story everyone likes to tell at conferences, that um, they actually wanted to use a different way to estimate the trajectory of the spaceship, but they realized they didn't have the computing storage space where they'd need to store many points in time to continue their estimation. So they had to roll out something where you only need to store one data point at a time and you just update. And so that's part of the beauty of something like a Kalman filter method, is you estimate your whole time series and you just keep a couple of numbers around. So even if you're estimating a time series that's millions of points or you know 10,000 points, something more reasonable, uh, you're only keeping one number. You're not storing the whole thing. So this can be really good on, on small machinery, such as the machinery of you know, the computers of the 60s and 70s. Uh, still useful today. These are largely developed in econometrics, so if you have an econ background, you probably have seen these quite a bit, whereas they are otherwise, unfortunately, fairly underutilized. They offer insights into the underlying structure, as we just illustrated, and it's also possible, um, not in the package we're using, but there are packages where you can inject Bayesian analysis via priors onto your parameters, so you can sort of build these out quite extensively. State space models generally, right? What, what's useful about state, sp state space models also compared to traditional ARIMA models? Um, they don't just offer forecasting and a set of coefficients. They sort of offer three different stages, and these are all inherent to fitting them. Stage number one is filtering. Filtering is this, remember I have this underlying assumption, I have some sort of noise in my data, or I have these underlying components, but I only get to measure the one thing, right? 
Filtering is a way of, at time t, I take all the data from zero up to time t, including time t, and I use that to make an estimate of sort of what is the true value right now, right? There's the value I'm seeing, but that might be fairly noisy versus the true value. And so you can see why that would be useful on the Apollo mission, right? Where actually is our spaceship, right? Our, our sensors say this, but is that actually where they are? Because it's pretty important to have a good idea of where they are. Next step is prediction, right? So in this case, at time t, I'm going to look t plus 1, or maybe even t plus k into the future, and that's something else I can do with a state space model, right? So I can both update where I think I am now, I can think about where I am in the future, and then finally I can do smoothing, which essentially is you have all of your data, or all the data of relevance, up to say big T, and I want to go back to some earlier time point and say, well, at time 10, whatever, at time 10, I thought I was at you know, this point, but now that I see where I ended up at the end, I realize I even get additional information. I can sort of back propagate that and get an even better estimation of where I was at that time. So that's called smoothing. So these, this is all functionality, the filtering and the smoothing that you don't get with an ARIMA model, right? So you actually do have new technology from having this perspective. Um, common filter. I thought about uh, having everyone code this up, but I decided this was not the best use of our time. Um, so this is just to sort of give you an overview. This is a, just sort of a high level overview, wiki graphic of how this works. You start with some sort of prior knowledge, uh, usually just some sort of vanilla Gaussian distribution. You have your underlying state and you have some model for how you should update that underlying state. So you make a prediction as to where you think it's going based on your knowledge of the system dynamics and its current trajectory. Once you make the prediction, you use that to do your update, right? You compare how your prediction, right, at time t, before I measured at time t, or at time t minus 1, the state of the world I saw was such that I predicted my time series would go this way, or my measurement, right? My measurement would go this way. But at time t, when I got to time t and got my measurement, my measurement had actually gone the other way, right? And so this becomes a way of balancing, well, my forecast wasn't totally meaningless, right? So I don't just discard that because I have new data. What I do is balance. Why does what I'm predicting versus what I actually measured, why are they so different, and how should I combine them to have something reasonable rather than just picking one or the other? So you do your update step, and then you go back to do your next time step. And then, uh, so this is sort of the forward propagation, and then going backward in time smoothing is very similar computationally, uh, but it's a separate cycle. So there's your common filter. Uh, the underlying model for what something looks like is something like this. So with a state space, you have an underlying state, and then you have what you can measure, right? So your underlying state, x, is going to be some sort of uh, model based on, on your right-hand side of your equation, you have f sub k times x times k minus 1. So how do you update your state based on what was earlier? That looks like a lot like an autoregressive model. <coughs> but on the other hand, you also have the option for inputs such as bk times uk. That would be what, to your knowledge, was happening at time t, not time t minus 1, right? So for example, in the case of Apollo, x sub k minus 1 is where they thought Apollo was at time k minus 1. But u sub k was, well, what are we doing with our motor or our rocket? Like, how are we positioning our propulsion system at this moment, or is it even on? That's what's described by u sub k, right? So you can also, if you know sort of what your astronauts are doing up there, you can factor that in as well. And then you have some sort of error term. So there's there's your uh, description of your underlying state, and then you have your measurement, which we'll call z sub k here, right? You recognize that in some way your measurement might not be directly the same as what your x sub k is, right? So in the Apollo example, your state where you are and your position that you measure, you know, should be the same thing. We don't have some sort of translation. But it could also be that these things are not in the same space, right? It could be that I'm actually x, maybe I'm measuring only velocity and acceleration, not position, and then somehow with my observation, I only get position, and I'm trying to find a way to translate between them. So the point I want to make here is just that these are really flexible. You can describe all sorts of dynamics, uh, but it does require that you have some kind of hypothesis about the dynamics of your system to really be interesting, right? So you might not want to throw this out a model of, say, really noisy stock data, and you're sort of like, I have no idea what this is, so like, let's make up a model and, and just put it in, because you probably won't get sensible outputs, but a model like a rocket where you have Newtonian physics and you have a flight plan makes a really good uh, case for this. Okay, and this is just spelled out more in detail. Um, you usually won't have to code this up yourself, but it's good to feel empowered and able to do so. Um, 
It looks really awful, but actually it's just a bunch of matrix multiplication and inversion. So good to remember that. You can look it up and code it if you want. OK. And then how do these models tend to get evaluated? Usually with your Akeki information criterion, your AIC. So just for anyone who's not familiar with this, I want to put it up. Um, it's two times your number of parameters minus two times your log likelihood, right? So um, you want it to be more negative when you're evaluating models. Uh, this is just one way you would, might evaluate models, such as state-space models. OK, so here are some models that we're going to look at in a, in a Jupyter notebook right after this. So we're going to look at uh, things like local linear trend or smooth trend. So this I pulled directly out of the stats models uh, package for the unobserved components model. So um, let's see, can you see this? No. Oh, yes, here's my mouse. OK, so uh, it can give you either two ways to select these. Either of these can be your inputs. And then this tells you sort of the underlying model that it's using. So in this case, uh, we have an underlying model where our observable is some function of the underlying state plus epsilon, some kind of error. And the underlying state itself is a function of its former state and also um, some sort of velocity type term, some kind of trend term of where it's moving. That's our beta plus some sort of error. And then our beta itself can change. So. Um, that's our local linear trend. And then take a look at the smooth trend and see if you spot the difference. They look quite similar, but there is one difference. So what's the difference? Yeah, right, so no, no stochastic term here. In the smooth trend, in the middle equation, there's no stochastic term, right? So that's just to give you a, a sense of the distinctions that people make. People sort of make these slight tweaks and they have different names. Um, but it's always best to just go look at the equations to see what they look like. OK, so now that I, I have bored your pants off with a bunch of slides, I think it's time to open the first uh, Jupyter Notebook. OK, um, so people should feel free to use either the instructor or the student version. Um, student version is if you don't want to be able to cheat. You know, that can be a good way to discipline, but you, should, you can be your own judge of what makes the most sense. OK, so the first thing we need to do is obtain and visualize our data. So in this case, I, um, I had downloaded some two different measurements of global temperature data. Um, yes? Yes, OK, so thank you, excellent point. Um, so from the base folder, these are in the state, state, state space models folder. Yeah, uh, I was late, sorry. Ah, OK, I'm sorry. So for anyone who walked in late, no worries. Um, the set of Jupyter Notebook slides are available on the Slack channel in a zip file. And otherwise, someone has helpfully posted them here. So I'm the one who posted them. I guess whatever version I grabbed didn't have student versions. It only has a instructor. Ah, I see. That's the older version. Sorry about that. OK, I really appreciate that. Um, so just want to confirm, do most people have the student instructor version? Let's see. So if you scroll up in the Slack, this was sent at 9.13 PM last night. It's the second version, rather than the one that's pinned. And I can upload it again so it will be the newest thing. OK, so that's the newest thing. So in that case, you should email scipy at nthought.com. Okay. And they will just tell them that, and they will almost instantly reply. Okay. I think someone's just manning that continuously. Other questions? OK. OK, so for those downloading, um, it's a pretty small zip file, so I think you should have it pretty quickly. I'm just going to uh, just slowly look at this data, and you should be caught up pretty quick. Oh, GitHub is updated? OK, great. Thank you. So GitHub is also updated if you find that more useful. That's this. 
Okay. Okay, so we're just at obtain and visualize data. Uh, so this CSV should be available in the zip file, and I have the source listed here. This is just two sources of global temperature data. Um, obviously, climate change data is a great source of arguing about time series, a great source of um, possibly ambiguous time series, depending on your politics. Uh, but it's a very rich source of debate, so I grabbed some of that. And the point of this data set is they have sort of two sources of the data um, that we can compare. So if we load that data and take a look at it, uh, the first thing I do is just plot, you know, just basic time series plot. I also uh, recommend sometimes that you don't plot the whole data set all at once, right? So for example, here I just looked at the first 100 data points. Um, anyone have an idea why I recommend that or why you might feel the same? That versus, let's look at this one. Yes, let's see. Maybe I'll zoom in. How's that? Okay, so um, I'm not especially satisfied with these plots. Does anyone feel satisfied with these plots? I hope not. Okay, so that's actually the first exercise I have for you. I'm not gonna scroll up for those who wanna have it be a secret until you figure it out, but so the first coding exercise for everyone, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes to figure out what's wrong with the way the data looks now and the plot and how can we fix it? Because it's not even just an aesthetic problem, there's an error right now. So this would be one of these, if I presented this to my boss, I should be really embarrassing kind of situation. So think about what that is and how you could correct it. Okay, so I think we had already covered the problems, right? We've got uh, data types that are not especially helpful. We've actually combined different measurements into one time series when actually that doesn't make any sense. Um, I should have been a little wary of that given that already even in my plot, I don't have time displaying, right? I have just sort of a random index. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna pivot our data. And then if we plot our data, um, Incidentally, it seems like that has reordered our date index appropriately, and now I'm seeing something more like what I expect. And now I'm looking only at one type, one time series instead of two, right? I actually have two time series in my data set. I should not plot them as one. Um, and as you see here, right, unfortunately often, and this is something that's tricky about time series, right, you can be plotting it the wrong way and it will still look reasonable, right? Especially if I didn't have domain knowledge about sort of global warming, that would have looked fine to me and maybe I would have foolishly carried on. Another problem though is I still, so now my, my dates seem to be in order, right? I could check more extensively, um, but they're still only useful as an index, whereas I would like something a little more useful. Um, so uh, let's just go through this. We won't do this as an exercise. How can we make the index more time aware? Well, nicely, Pandas provides um, date time and also period time indexes, so we're gonna use date time. Um, and if we do this, we see we now have a date time index instead of a base index class. So what do I get from that? Well, already notice compared to this plot, which I already thought was okay, I've now got a plot where these are not being treated as strings, they're being treated as actual dates. And so pandas can fill in a little bit of background knowledge about what sort of labeling would be reasonable. And then I also get sort of handy label um, indexing like this. So now I can now index, say, by year, right? Just DF1880 is gonna show me all the 1880s. Uh, which also is just gonna make my life easier. I can do some plotting like this. So now I plot both series from 1880 to 1950 um, and get a sense of how correlated they are. Or I can just plot everything from 1950 onwards and again, get all that nice functionality with the date time. So this is just a reminder that that's available to you and it can be very helpful. Um, and obviously always look carefully at uh, your data before you get started. Okay, so a uh, quick exercise. How strongly do these measurements correlate contemporaneously? What about with a time lag? So now we've got two groups of um, data. Just quickly, two minutes. How helpful are they for predicting one another or for understanding one another? Y, y 
It can, it can depend a lot on um, from one package to another. I guess one critique I would even have of the Python space is there's not a lot of uniformity around this because the functionality is spread out among many packages. Um, and not to be anti-Python, because Python is my first love, but R actually does a better job of having more of a unified interface. Okay, so how strongly do these measurements correlate contemporaneously? There's all sorts of ways to think about that. Um, but just want to point out, we can, you know, just do simple things like scatter plots, right? So now I'm plotting uh, the two measurements, the GCAG and the GIS temp, against one another uh, for the exact same time period. So at any given time, they seem to correlate pretty strongly. If I, you know, if I saw something like that in my work more often, I would be delighted. Um, similarly, we can ask, what about with a year's offset, right? What do these have any sort of predictive value for each other? So in this case, I'm plotting 1880 to 1899 for one variable versus 1881 to 1900 for the other. So I've just offset it by a year. What does that look like? That begins to look more like the real world and, and what I see at my job anyway. But um, is it terrible? Well. It, it depends on your domain, right? Maybe for predicting air passengers, this would be terrible. Maybe for predicting housing prices, it's not so bad. Uh, we can look at the Pearson R, and we see um, it's not zero, right? I mean, actually, this probably looks worse than it is. So it can also be good to have different measures, visual and numeric. And again, just as a reminder, we can sort of look at the data with standard, um, standard tools from Pandas. And then if we want to get a, an idea of our date range, we can look at our min and max for our index, right? So all sorts of standard op operations. OK, so now we're going to throw this into an un unobserved component model. I'm only interested in training on the data from 1960 onwards. Just personal choice. I thought that's a little bit more interesting. That's sort of where we see things taking off. We're going to define our model. So we have our model parameters. And all I'm going to say, say is I want a smooth trend for my level, I want no cycle and no seasonality. That's sort of my first pass based on these plots we did here, right? So looking sort of at 1960 onwards, I'm like, eh, I don't know if I see much cycling or seasonality. Arguably, I could be more careful about this, but this is going to be my first pass. So I build my model with a dictionary. I fit my model, so I'm going to make an unobserved components object from stats models, right? So stats models has a whole time series analysis uh, API, including a state space API with unobserved components. I give it my data, and I just give it the model to unpack, right? And there's other sort of parameters you can tweak, and you can read up about those in the um, documentation. But this is as simple as it is for a first pass. I'm then going to fit my model, and I'm going to plot the components, right? Because this is what I was talking about as being like the great thing as compared to an ARIMA. OK, so I've plotted my components. What do I see here? I've got my predicted versus observed plot. Uh, so how do, we, how do we feel about this fit? Seems like we're always within our confidence interval. Seems to follow pretty well. This is a one step ahead prediction, right? So you also would want to think about whether that's sort of interesting to you. Is it interesting to predict global temperatures one month in advance, or would we like to try more? We'll try more below. Um, we also can look at our two components, right? So we have a level component and a trend component. What do we think about these? How do these look compared to what I showed you in the PowerPoint? I would say not great, right? They, they both sort of look like wiggly lines. I would say that I don't get a whole lot of insight out of this. When I look at it, I say, hmm, level versus trend. I mean, they both, it looks like, hmm, OK, the model mostly, mostly gives the absolute value of the time series to the level. And then it's almost like the trend is just whatever was left over, but it doesn't look like a meaningful trend. So thinking about that, I think, OK, well, let me revisit that. And we will revisit that in a couple of steps. We might also want to plot our predictions. So to do that, we can also set a greater time horizon to do at the end to do dynamic predictions. So if you move down to the next cell, I set the number of steps I want to predict forward as being 20, so 20 months arbitrarily chosen. Um, so now I want to get predictions. And I want to do the last 20 steps as dynamic, meaning that now I'm not going to update at each step. Right? That's when we do our one step ahead forecasting. Now, for my last 20 steps, 
it's just going to roll with those 20 steps. It's just going to take what it predicted, and that will be its new input. Take what it predicted, that will be its new input, and it's going to move forward. Um, so if I do that, this is what I get. And I want to draw your attention to the end. What do you notice at the end, sort of this upper right-hand corner? It's just sort of a flat line, right? Um, so that's another thing you're going to notice with these models to be aware of, right? When you're doing sort of multi-step horizons, um, they're not so great in the sense of since there's no error, they'll just assume there is no error, and they're just going to sort of keep going along whatever smooth trajectory is established by the underlying model. That can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what you want to do. Um, this certainly will look a little bit different, say, from an ARIMA model, where you will sort of see more wiggles and things like that. OK, and then how does it do? How does this model do? Well, it looks pretty good for one step ahead, right? Um, but can I, can I really decide if it's really good just based on one, one plot? Well, no, especially if I'm not comparing this to what would my null model look like, right? I need to think about what my null model would look like. Um, you can also do a cleaner plot. So this is just to illustrate if you want to put in um, some confidence bounds. Again, this red now is showing your dynamic prediction. Your dotted lines are showing your confidence bounds. Um, they don't look fantastic either, right? So here's another difference, say, compared to if you're used to an ARIMA model. Um, your confidence bounds will rapidly diverge because of this unincorporated error that you no longer are able to handle. And we can look at this also more up close to get a sense. And as you can see what we discussed, right? Your, your forward moving prediction is just going to be a flat line for these simple models. OK, uh, so next exercise for you all is consider adding a seasonal term for 12 periods to the model fit above. And does this improve the fit of the model? So we had initially rejected seasonality, but should we revisit that? And how do you do it? Um, if you're not sure, go to the Stats Models API. You can Google that and look for the unobserved components uh, documentation. So let's take a couple minutes to look at that. Okay. So also, I've just posted the slides. I had a request to post slides, so those are now also in the time series channel. OK, so how do we add a seasonal term here? We uh, keep a local linear trend, and now we add a seasonal parameter, which we set to 12. Why 12? It's monthly data, right? So what, what if anything else, would I expect, right? So if the, if the Earth has a seasonality, that would be my guess as to what it is. And if we now plot our components, um, we see something interesting now, right? So we see what looks like a very uh, regular seasonal component, which again shows how silly I was not to have done more exploration of my data at the start when beginning to think about what kind of model would be appropriate. We also see now that sort of the trend component has gone to just this negligible thing. It's not really adding to the model. We have a level component and a seasonal component, and that already seems to do a pretty good job. So how does this compare to the original model? Uh, if we wanted to compare them, we might think about, for example, uh, comparing the correlation of the two models with the data. And we see these are sort of indistinguishable, right? So that to my mind, is not a very helpful metric and shows how we should be skeptical because visually, clearly, one was doing a better job of describing the data or offering more intuition to us than the other. Um, so that shows sometimes that these numerical measurements might not be very informative. Um, and what about if we look at the mean absolute error? Um, in that case, uh, in both cases, we see that the new model does slightly better, but yes. Ah, okay, so um, if you look at the, uh, I'll, I'll go up and hopefully you have this in your notebook as well. Um, it's, this is the seasonal component. So the seasonal component is not zero, it's, it's clearly significant, and it's showing sort of a pattern that makes sense based on our domain knowledge of some kind of 12-month cycle of the Earth's temperature. Yes. Okay, I'm glad people are just interrupting me when, whenever is helpful, because that's what this is about. Okay, so... Um, point here is, especially with structural models, people sometimes try to optimize them just looking at something like the AIC, and that's great, and it's at least some sort of measure. But arguably, especially because structural models are mainly just sort of helping your intuition and helping you understand the underlying dynamics, 
Um, you might find that a model that looks much worse visually that isn't offering intuition doesn't do that much worse, right? But then it's not offering any value. So a big part of thinking about when to use these models and how to use them is what are they teaching you about the data? And it's really interesting to me that in this case, we see an illustration of how just exploring models pointed out something that we sort of initially missed about this data because we did insufficient exploration. Um, that's another way this can be better than ARIMA. For example, with an ARIMA, um, you might notice that your model isn't fitting your data very well, but you won't get such easy insights into why. Versus here, we say, oh, look, boom, I added a seasonal term, and I can actually see the seasonality rather than just seeing a coefficient. Okay, so now let's explore the seasonality more. What's something else we see here? We see that our trend component wasn't especially useful. So why don't we get you why don't we get rid of it altogether? How do we do that? We switch to a local level model instead of a local trend model, and we keep our seasonality. So if we do that, we really um, now we get something that looks really beautiful in terms of not having extraneous uh, portions of our model, like a whole trend component that we don't really need. Um, we also see the seasonal component, again, very strong signal. Um, interestingly, it is not time varying, right? It's just sort of uniform. And we see a sort of a level drifting, but tending to drift in the positive direction, right? So to the extent that we want to have debates about climate change, uh, this is one insight of like, oh, if I fit this kind of model, I see gradually that the level is going up and I see a seasonality. And that can be sort of first order way to talk about this data when you're first getting into it. Uh, question in the back? No, OK. OK. And then we can again sort of look at the mean absolute error, and we see that we are continuing to improve. These are sort of small incremental improvements, not ma massive improvements. Uh, but mainly, we are having a more parsimonious model that gives us better intuition into our data. OK. And then once we see this, re we realize we really should have revisited our data and thought about the shape of it, right? So if we sort of plot here, we can see uh, more seasonality by looking more closely. Although we see that this is not as clean a seasonality um, picture as we saw, say, with the air passengers data, right? So it's a noisier seasonality, and yet our structural model did a pretty good job of capturing it nonetheless. OK, so final exercise, and then we're going to take a break. Um, a common null model for time series is to predict the value at time t minus 1 for the value at time t. So how does such a model compare to the models we fit here? Just take two minutes to compare those, right? Have we actually done anything with sort of our fancy structural time series model, or are we just kidding ourselves? Something you always have to be asking yourself with the fancy methods. Yeah, exactly. So basically, it will just have a coefficient for, it will have 12, 11 different coefficients, right? You don't need 12, right? You need n minus 1 for n seasons. And then you'll have a coefficient per, and you'll say, oh, at this point, we add or subtract this much. And that's where you get that seasonal component. Say you have, <coughs> say you have, say you have 10 and a half years, you divide it into 12, so will still be monthly data? Yeah, so it can handle something like an incomplete cycle. Uh, well, I should, I should really be saying an incomplete seasonal cycle as compared to a cycle, because structural time series can also handle a cycle. What a cycle is, is when you have some sort of repeated pattern, but it's not as regular as a season. So for a season, the way that these models are fit is there's sort of a different component per season. So there will be 11 components to describe the 12 season model, right? Because one of them will just be the null component, like every, every other kind of model that does this. Um, and then if you want to fit cyclical data, what that will usually fit to is sort of a sign curve, where what it's then trying to fit to is to determine the appropriate frequency to model the data. And you can also add things like a damping parameter, so you have sort of a uh, sign curve, right? This, this would be one way to start with a cycle, but then usually what you want to do is you want to both allow this to vary, so this will itself, the frequency will be time dependent, unlike a season where the frequency is fixed. And it will also have the option, uh, for those who are either physicists or remember, um, of some sort of like damping envelope is something else you can fit to. But that's not what we see in our data, right? We, uh, in this data, arguably, we see some kind of seasonal. So in that case, so for seasonal, you will really have like um, S sub 1, S sub 2, S sub 3, and so on. And it will just assume that S sub 1 is what you start with. It doesn't actually care. What we consider the first one, it will just take that, and as long as it goes around in a circle, it's good. 
Okay, so um, how does our null model compare to what we did? So, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Absolutely. So this is even a problem with ARIMA models, right, which seem sort of more traditional statistical. Um, it's what's interesting, for example, just to back out for ARIMA, and then I'll come back to this case. Um, you can actually have models that look different. They look like they have different parameters. But actually, if you do the polynomial math, you can factor out, and you realize you have like sort of extra terms that literally just cancel out. And you are literally fitting a model that math tells you is too complicated. Like your model makes no sense mathematically. So even with a simpler method like that. Um, with structural time series, I, I consider them more useful sort of a, as an exploratory tool. It's not something I wouldn't fly an airplane or treat cancer based on the outcome of this. Now that's just me. Many econ econometricians might feel a little bit differently. Um, the more data you have, the better. If you move this into a Bayesian model where you have a much stronger prior, that's also better. Um, and actually, Google has a great Bayesian structural time series package. Um, because then you at least have uh, stronger inputs into what you want. So if you inject, say, a strong prior from a Bayesian sense, then I would trust these a little bit more versus if you are just using your default Gaussians and rolling with what it is. Absolutely. And these can be very easy to overfit, like um, many sort of data-intensive, computation-intensive models. And there is no guarantee also that you get to the optimum fit for your data. But arguably, that's even a good thing, right? Because getting to your optimum fit for your data could be overfitting as well. Yes? Yeah. One quick question. Uh, when we did the first model, we used like a smooth frame. And then in the second one, we used a local lean. Uh, how do we pick what to use in terms of the methods? So this depends on the discipline. Certain disciplines will have very strong uh, priors, not in the Bayesian sense of the shape of the distribution, but in the definition of the model. Uh, so for example, if you're modeling the stock market, you have to make a very strong case for using anything stronger than, say, a random walk. And you'd have to have a justification. Um, another example I know of is people um, modeling hydrology feel very strongly that that should just be a local level model without a trend. Uh, so that tends to come from other domain knowledge or theories about causation of the data you're seeing. Yeah, so in, in this case, we're just exploring because we are not climate change experts. Um, so for example, I, I would be very skeptical if, if someone went to Congress with this and said, look, I've, I've figured it out, for example. OK. OK, so very quickly, and then we'll, we'll take a quick break. Um, so if we're looking at our null model compared to this model, if we consider the correlation, they're not measurably different, right? So we've done all this work, fancy model, but it's not, um, it's not clear we've done much better. Maybe we've done a tiny bit better, and maybe that matters. But as we were just discussing, since it's possible to overfit our models, or there's so many knobs to turn, we have to look at skepticism, right? So whether this is a good model will depend on your purposes, um, whether you're just trying to interpret it, are you trying to make predictions, and what sort of accuracy do you need, right? Is half a percentage point improvement in correlation meaningful in your field or no? It's very context dependent. But otherwise, I mean, if you're someone's boss and they come to you with this, obviously the first thing you should do is shoot them down and say, do you really need this? Because you've barely improved on your null model. So explain to me why, why you haven't. And what about in terms of mean absolute error? Um, well, here we have quite a difference, right? So, so maybe this is what, something worth thinking about, right? And maybe we should say, OK, well, well why is that? And, and how can we improve that? And what insights does that offer us, right? So again, just a reminder to use different metrics and think about your context. OK. Um, so those are structural models. We're going to take a short break. And then we're going to come back and do hidden Markov models. And that will be a wrap on state space. So uh, let's just call it a five minute break and come back at 9.22. OK, so our break is over. I just dumped my email address in the Slack also in case that's not available on SciPy. So if anyone. Um, has questions after the tutorial or follow-up comments, great to hear from you. Yes. So the slides are in the Slack as a zip file. Um, and then for anyone who wasn't here at the beginning, I am unfortunately locked out of GitHub at the moment. Uh, for very, It's a very long story. So as soon as I'm back in GitHub, they'll also be on Git. And, and someone has nicely posted them on Git now. Uh, but ultimately, I would like to, you know, have the slides and the Git and the repository all together. Um, so, and also, if you email me once I get that together, hopefully in a few days, you can also have that. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay.
Any other questions? Okay. Okay. And then just so folks know, we'll definitely do another break before they stop serving breakfast at 1030 in case anyone needs to pick me up. So. Okay, so we're going to be talking about hidden Markov models now. This is another technique. It's not uh, especially novel or considered cutting edge, but it's increasingly useful because now you can actually get decent computing power as opposed to when it was invented, you know, and maybe if you were at IBM and had a really fancy computer or whatever, you might be able to fit it. Now we can all, you know, just fit it on our laptops. So much more relevant than it used to be. What is a hidden Markov model? Why is this a state space, state space model? Well, it's the same idea in the sense of having the idea that there is an underlying state that you cannot observe, and there is the output of that state, which you can observe. In the structural time series models, we tend to have the model that uh, the state and the measured quantity are basically the same thing with error. But we can also broaden our perspective with hidden Markov models and think, well, maybe what we observe might not even be in the same physical or conceptual category as the underlying state that's producing it. So in this case, what we have, we have a sequence of measurements as depicted here, where we envision I feel strongly that people should be able to come and go whenever they want, so no one, no one is imprisoned here. Okay, or locked out on the way back. Um, so in this sense, what we envision is we have a, a sequence of states, and for whatever reason, the dynamics of that system, the states are evolving over time. Uh, we conceptualize this in a discrete time framework, but this can also be in continuous time, and you can do hidden Markov models in continuous time. We won't look at those, but if those describe your data, you can think about that. Um, so we have a sequence of discrete times where uh, the underlying state is evolving. We can't see that directly. What we can observe is whatever the observable is y also at those times. And somehow x, the underlying state, is what produces a certain kind of y. So how do we make this more physical? Well, one example where this is widely used and actually where you don't even need to have the fiction of um, discrete time steps is in DNA analysis. So when people look at DNA sequences and they're trying to think about why do I see maybe certain peptides or why do I see a certain sequence and what does that tell me about the underlying state of the DNA? I'm not a biologist, so I'm probably slaughtering this, but the point is, is you have these DNA chunks that really are coming in discrete measures. And there's an example where it is a time series in the sense of having an axis that is well ordered and has a good definition of sort of moving forward or backward along an axis. So that's an example where maybe your underlying state, again, don't, don't hold me to it on the biology, maybe your underlying state is something like how methylated is this chunk of DNA? And what you observe maybe is something like um, over time, like what kind of enzymes are being produced at this time? What kind of distribution? So notice that X itself, um, the underlying state, that's usually going to be something that's discreetly defined, right? I have a countable number of states. These are discrete states. I'm not going to be in two at the same time, although, again, you can model anything, right? You can make things infinitely complicated, but that's not the traditional HMM. Um, and then your outputs, these can either be discrete or they can be continuous, right? So in the discrete case, it could be like, what kind of sequence am I observing, where that sequence is some other kind of indicator but not the state, or it can be some kind of continuous variable. So an example of that, um, and the one we're going to model in our notebook, is we can think of rivers as being sort of in high flow or low flow states uh, to first order, and then we can think about, well, if you're in a high flow or a low flow state, what kind of flow are you going to see? That's the Y. And the Y will be a continuous variable, right? So it's not like I'll see exactly the same number for low state versus high state. And there's a good chance that the distributions will overlap. But if I sort of look at the whole sequence, I might get a sense of, oh, these were low, and these were high, and these were low. So why might I use this, say, as opposed to an ARIMA model? And I don't mean to say the ARIMA model is the be-all, end-all, but we should think, well, why would I choose this model over, say, another one that's known to perform well? Well, there's a couple of reasons. So again, just like with structural time series, this offers us some kind of intuition and some kind of sort of model of the underlying dynamic. So to the extent we have a model like that for a particular system like this, if it fits, then that's a good thing because it can offer us some kind of insight. 
Um, another thing, for example, in the case of river flow, and this I learned just from reading a hydrologist <laughs> blog uh, who was blogging about HMMs, is that they find that ARIMA models um, don't capture these sort of nonlinear dynamics of it's not that you know time t minus 1 predicts time t. It's more of this sort of regime switching where you know kind of the probability of the regime switching. But when you last switched regimes, doesn't necessarily tell you when you will next switch regimes. Um, and that's a feature of Markov processes in general, right? The whole point of a Markov process is that when I'm at t minus 1, if I know my state at t minus 1, I don't even really care what came before. So that's quite different from an ARIMA model where I say, oh, I'm looking at my whole history to determine where I'm going next. With a hidden Markov model, I'll say, as long as I know x t minus 1, I don't need to look backwards in time. Sort of all the information I need is in that data point. So those are just a few observations about hidden Markov models and when you might want to use them. OK, so there are state space model. Observations are an indicator of the underlying state. But we posit some separate underlying state. And in this case, you really wouldn't posit that your underlying state is just your observable with error. That's not sort of what you're doing with a hidden Markov model, unlike the structural time series. In a Markov process, the past doesn't matter if the present status is known, right? So the most informative thing is just your most recent measurement, and nothing else gives you new information. So these things, the two um, aspects computationally I want to talk a bit about before we fit are parameter estimation with the Baum-Welch algorithm and smoothing slash state labeling with the Viterbi algorithm. So I'm guessing you've seen these words floating around. I just want to give you a, an overview or an intuition for what they are before we use them. OK, so the Baum-Welch algorithm is how we determine parameters. So when would we use this? This is at the very start. This is like I have a time series. I have a sense that there's some kind of regime switching. But more than that, I really have no idea. Like I have no priors. There's nothing I know about sort of whether you know the mean of one state is 3 or 17. I have no idea. So this is really amazing in the sense of you can just say, here's, here's my data, and here's how many sort of underlying states I think I have. Go, and, and it will sort of figure out a set of parameters. Now, of course, what, what does that entail? It's the same um, concern we talked about earlier. You have a lot of knobs to turn. Uh, this is a very complicated situation, right? When you start thinking about how you would code this up if you just had to code this yourself, it's sort of a nightmare. Um, so basically what that means, it, it's not guaranteed to converge to a global maximum. You're not guaranteed to get the absolute best parameters to describe your data. What this algorithm does guarantee is that you will always get a little bit better with each cycle of this algorithm. So it's a forward, backward, expectation maximization algorithm, right? Which means you sort of first figure out um, what your likelihood expectation is given your data. That's your expectation step. And then your maximization step is you sort of update your estimate of your parameters to maximize the likelihood given that expression of the likelihood form. And then you do it again, right? And you just sort of do it and do it and do it until you get to what you think is an acceptable convergence level or an acceptable likelihood. But that will only get you to a local maximum. So that's another thing to keep in mind with these models, right? Again, there, there's not some sort of unique, well-defined, closed-form solution. And often what people will recommend is that you run it many, many times before you sort of make any pronouncements on what this is showing you, right? So you don't just run it once. Maybe you run it 100 times and look at what um, your your parameter estimations are and, and see if some sort of like narrative or some form is emerging from your many, many uh, attempts. And of course, keep in mind you can overfit the data, right? So it's quite easy to maybe choose a set of parameters that will do much better on your training data than on some sort of validation holdout. So that's always um, a risk with these sorts of things. OK, so just a brief overview of the details, right? What's the problem? You're trying to estimate basically um, three things. You're trying to estimate A, which is sort of your transition matrix probability. So what's that? If we go back, your A is sort of telling you how likely at X you are to transition to some other state at the next time step, including the same state. So A describes from XT minus 1 to XT, what does my transition look like? Am I likely to stay in the same state? Am I likely to go to a different state? And let's quantify that, right? It's not just you don't get an answer of a little likely, not likely, right? You actually get a matrix saying to go from, from state I to state J, your probability is 0.4. To go from state I to state K, your probability is 0.2 or whatever and so on. So that's the first thing you're trying to fit. Your B is describing what's the probability of seeing a value at Y given a particular state at X. So you're seeing another matrix there or another sort of set of parameters indexed off your state. 
how likely is a particular y assuming a particular underlying state? And then what's the final thing you need to describe this model? Pi for the priors. That's telling you how likely you are to sort of begin in a particular state. So this model also posits some sort of beginning, uh, which is something you want to think about. Maybe if you're taking the same time series and just slicing it up over and over again. Uh, the idea of a prior is saying, well, no, we, we sort of think you're likely to start in some state. So you need to think a little bit about what does starting mean and does my data sort of acceptably fit that. So on your forward step, essentially what you're doing is you're developing the probability of being at time t, where t can be any time, uh, the probability of being in state i at x t, and at the same time, right, so this is a combined probability, the probability of seeing the whole sequence of your actual observations at y1 all the way up to y t. So that's your forward step. You're sort of moving forward in time. How probable at x t is it that I'm in state i and that I've seen all this data at the same time. And then you go backwards in the other direction, and then you say, okay, on the other hand, how probable is it if, you know, so in this case, conditional on being in state i at time t, how probable is it that I see then the sequence from t plus 1 all the way to t, right? So you're sort of effectively picking a point in the middle. Your forward step is how probable is it that I'm in steps, uh, state i and I've seen this data, and your backward step is, again, I'm still in state i. How probable is the data that comes after it, given that I'm in step i? Right? So you can see it's some sort of measure of we're converging on this measure of how probable is this whole sequence from the point of view of this point in time. And then you estimate two other parameters, right, which essentially are just expressions of these. So we calculated this alpha and the beta, right, the forward and the backward. And from these, you can express so, sort of more generic quantities, such as above gamma sub i is the probability of being in, in state i at time t, given all the data you've observed, the full time series, and your estimation of theta, right, your parameters. And you can also estimate how probable it is that you're in state i at time t and in state j at time t plus 1. That's giving you that final component of the behavior, which is the transitioning, um, given the data you've seen in the theta. So it's a lot of programming, as you can imagine. This is just to make you aware of sort of what's going on under the hood. And from this, you can then estimate those three quantities, right? The pi for the prior, how likely you are at the beginning of a sequence to be in any given starting state, because that will influence where you go from there. Uh, alpha sub i j, how likely you are to transition from state i to state j at a particular time step. And finally, uh, beta which is how likely you are to see a particular observed value given you're in a particular underlying state. Okay, so that's how we would estimate the parameters. This is really computationally taxing. It's really difficult, and like I said, you're not guaranteed to get to the perfect parameters. You will get to one iteration of parameters that are a global maximum um, optimization. Final slide before we go to some code. What's the other thing we want to do? So first we want to have the parameters to sort of explain our underlying sequence, right? If we posit a certain number of states, what parameters can we come up with to describe the behavior? Okay, now we've got those parameters. Let's say we accept them and want to move forward. Then what we need to do is figure out if we posit these underlying parameters as describing our state, what actually were my states in my time series at each time step? I can actually get a label. And how do I do this? I do this via the Viterbi, Viterbi algorithm for determining sequence. So this has to come afterwards. To use this, I need to have those parameters describing my time series. If I have that, this is a dynamic programming problem. Uh, for those who don't know the term, dynamic programming is basically when you realize that your larger problem is actually composed of a smaller problem. You can, that sounds like recursion, but it's different because you can also memoize it. It's sort of a limited, countable, ordered set of problems, right? So why does that describe this? Why is this not just recursion and dynamic programming? Because I have a set number of steps in my whole path. I have a set number of options I can explore. So if you think about it, I could actually summarize all of that in a matrix, right? So to get from, say, uh, time 0 to time 3, that would be like in my matrix 0 to 3. And I have to think about, like, what's the best way to do that? And I could explore all of the possible states, permute those states versus the cost, and I can ultimately sort of come up with the most probable way to go through those states. 
If that sounds complicated and like I'm waving my hands, I definitely am. You can read the code. It's actually not that bad, but it's a pain in the butt to code, right? But you sort of get the sense of like all the things you'd need to think about to code this up properly and make sure you found the most probable path through your data. So leave it at that. This is a great example, though, of something that could be accessible if you did want to code it up on your own. OK, so now we're going to open um, the second, <coughs> the second notebook as soon as I find my notebook. So again, in state space models, now we're looking at the Gaussian HMM. So Gaussian hidden, hidden Markov model is where you're going to have continuous observables. You can also have a multinomial hidden Markov model where both your underlying state and your observable are sort of these discrete states. So that's another thing. If that better describes your data, you could look into. OK, so in this case, um, as I mentioned, I was trying to get Colorado River data, but uh, the website wasn't working so well. I don't know if that's also budget cuts or whatever, but um, we're going to look at the Nile instead. Um, this is a very famous data set. If you read traditional stats textbooks, this is all over. Um, so if we look at the Nile data, we see that we don't have the problem. Hold on, I need to clear this. Start over. We don't want to be giving away the answers. We don't have the problem of sort of multiple groups of uh, observations. We just have one value for each year, just the, the flow for that year. Uh, we don't even know when this was taken or if it's a cumulative value. Uh, but what we do see is um, we see this plot, right? So this is kind of interesting given what the hydrologists told us based on the one hydrology blog I've ever read. There's sort of a high flow and a low flow state to first order if you want to model a river system. That could be due to things like El Nino or whatever the equivalent is in the Nile region, right? But these sort of global, larger global cycles or patterns or states um, that are affecting things like river flow that are not things like just one year predicts the next, but more like you are in one regime and at some point you switch to another, but it's not deterministic, some kind of nonlinear uh, stochastic switching. So if I sort of eyeball this, to me, I'm like, wow, this already looks like sort of two states, right? Like I've sort of got this high thing up here and this low thing up here. The one bit of background research I did is I thought, oh, man, is this when the Soviets built that dam on the Nile? Maybe that's just building the dam. But then if you look at the, um, the time stamp, it's around 1900, which was definitely not when the Soviets were building the, the dam on the Nile. So we know it wasn't that. So we say, OK, I'm going to assume this is some sort of climatological phenomenon we're looking at. Um, so let's take a look at the API for HMM Learn. So a little bit of history about HMM Learn. I believe this used to be part of Scikit-Learn, and then it split off to be its own project and was a continuation. So just be aware of that uh, when you look into hidden Markov models. Um, it was sufficiently complex or interesting to be its own thing, although it has a similar API. So uh, first tricky thing is actually they just sort of require this shape. They require two dimensions for their input. So that's why there's this expand dims. Um, if you run it without that, you'll get an error and you'll just have to put it back in. So I very generously just gave that to you. We're going to start with saying there's two states, right? There's going to be a low flow state and a high flow state. I just read that in my hydrology blog, so it must be good. We set up the model as a Gaussian HMM. And very nicely, see, we only have to set the number of components, the number of iterations. And then I just want to fit it with my values. And I want to get the hidden state. So I run a model predict. So let's just run that. Um, and let's see, what do we even get for hidden states? We get a numpy array. And what's the shape? The shape is the same thing we put in. And what does it look like? Oh, it's, it's a bunch of numbers. And actually, they're all the same number, which is not especially interesting so far. If I look at it, sort of. It looks like I have two values. One has 72 count. The other has 28 count. That's not telling me that much. What if I plot it? Um, so I'm plotting my hidden state. Note that a hidden state is not something it necessarily makes sense to plot in the sense of like the higher state is not necessarily the higher value. So just keep in mind, this is just to show sort of a label in a really quick and easy way. It is the number on the hidden state means absolutely nothing. Um, so the fact that I sort of go from high to low doesn't mean anything by itself, just looking at ones and zeros. Um, but what do we notice here? This versus what I saw above. Is it, is it telling me anything I didn't know? Not especially, right? Because all it, all it said is, 
oh yeah, you were in one state here, and then it seems like you took a nosedive and you're in another state. There's two states, and it sort of agrees with me there. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to fix this or what might be more interesting and informative. But before we do that, I would say, since we now realize uh, we're going to want to experiment a bit, is I would ask you to just take a couple of minutes and think, how can we package this API a little more conveniently? Um, so go ahead and read up on the HMM Learn uh, Gaussian HMM API. And also think, basically, I want you to turn this into a function so that I can just call it really easily instead of having to sort of write this over and over. Um, here's one solution. I imagine folks had other ideas, but the main goal would be you'd want something that accepts both your values and also your states. Um, it could be convenient to have that reshape in case you are often passing in data that lacks that second dimension, right? Better to just get that stuff out of the way, take the mental tax off. Um, in this case, I'm going to have the same, the same model, right? So the number of components, which I now want to make configurable. I chose not to make the number of iterations configurable, but that's sort of up to you to decide. Um, number of iterations tends to depend more on the quality of your data rather than, or the nature of your data rather than the number of states uh, to first order. So this wouldn't be something you'd have to adjust that much for the same data set. Uh, we grab the hidden states. We also probably want to extract some more information, right? Just knowing the state label by itself is not that interesting. I also want to know what the Baum-Welch algorithm found to be sort of the mean and standard deviation for this Gaussian model that I'm developing, right? So in this case, um, these, these describe sort of what I expect to see coming out of my observable data. And then, so that's the, the mu's and the sigmas, right, are the, the Gaussian distributions for the y's given the underlying state. And then transmat is the transition matrix. This is the thing that describes how likely are you to go from state i to state j. I want to see that as well because that's going to give me some information about what the underlying dynamics look like and does this match my theory of how river flow works. Um, so if I were to only do that, that would be all right, but I actually also like, um, personally, I like to reorder the output because the output comes out in sort of an arbitrary order, right? Like, as I said, the hidden state labels don't mean anything. They're just arbitrary labels. They continue to be arbitrary labels no matter what, but what I like to do is at least label them in sort of order from, like, lowest to highest. So lowest mean has the lowest um, hidden state label. Highest mean has the highest hidden state label, and that just at least to me offers some way of saying, oh, that's a bigger one, that's a smaller one. But it doesn't mean more than that. So I um, have this code to just re-permute everything, including the transition matrix. And if I do that, we can now fit a method that will give us the hidden states, the mu's, the sigma's, the transition matrix, and the model, should we wish to do more with the model. So we run that again. Um, and then... I won't leave this as an exercise. I think we'll just go through it. But how might we want to plot this? Well, what things do we want to plot? We want to plot the real value. And then we want to plot the hidden state in some way, right? I'd like to have these overlaid in some way. This is a matter of personal preference. Some people will do things like sort of color the background according to the state you're in. Like I said, I have this idiosyncratic way of I like to just plot the state as a line graph, so long as I preserve in my mind the fact that this does not mean anything except as an indicator of different values, right? So it's not actually um, indicating anything about uh, the size of those values. Yes, thank you. Which part? Uh, the this part. one, yes, right, because I thought I would run that first. Thank you. Okay, so now my states are in, are in the order that I want them to be in, right? I, I like just the highest mean to be the highest labeled state. Again, does not mean anything more than that. It just means they're sort of in ordinal order. So here I, I still got, I have the same uninformative, oh, yeah, you were in some sort of like higher flow regime, and now you're in some sort of lower uh, level or lower flow regime. Um, but this hasn't taught me much. So the next exercise for you guys, now that we have this in a, a form where we can experiment and plot our results easily, I'd like you to try two different ways of maybe improving on this that I would recommend. One of them is to cut off this sort of earlier set of time points, which might not be that informative or might just be too fundamentally different to be that interesting. Because I'm not interested in an outcome that just says, oh, for 20 years you were in one state and then for 80 years you're in another state. Not super interesting. So can I cut off the region of interest and rerun the analysis? 
And then the second method is to think, well, maybe I'm not looking at two underlying states. Should I try it with a different number of underlying states and see what that looks like? So go ahead and take a few minutes to work on those two options. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the first possibility, right? We can cut off the special region, which uh, to my mind means we, like this first state, it seems to be so different, right? It, it just takes over that first state. And I think, well, maybe that was some sort of extraordinary event. I want to rule that out. I'm interested in the sort of more typical dynamics of the river. So why don't I just cut off those first um, 27, 28 values and model that. And if I do that, um, I didn't put it into my fancy plotting function, but I can, I can see more switching now. And this is sort of more what I would expect based on the very little I know about hydrology, right? I'm not looking for some regime shift of like 20 years and then 80 years, right? That's, that sounds like almost like a geological event or something. Um, I'm interested in sort of more every few years El Nino type stuff. So that's one way to do it. But do I really need to do that? Because that feels like then maybe my model doesn't describe my data very well if I have to sort of cut off whole periods. And, and maybe that's fine for my purposes. But I also want to see, well, maybe can this just be a little more robust? So what if we instead just add another hidden state, right? What if I say, well, maybe there was this extraordinary state, and then there's the normal two-state dynamics. So can this accommodate that? So if I put in three states and plot that, well, this does seem to be accommodating this, right? I have I have my one state that's sort of the initial extraordinary state. I have um, another state and another state. So I have my three states. Um, I seem to have gone wrong somewhere in my ordering of my states, so I will have to fix that bug uh, during our break. Ideally, the first state would sort of be up high, and then it would jump low and high and low. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, but what we see is we see more switching now, right? So we see that this model is robust enough that it can sort of describe a state that was sort of very long and very different, and then accommodate regime shifting as well. And if I look at my muse, what do I see? I see, um, ah, I know what I did, sorry. Let me fix my plotting if I can. No, sorry. Um, so I have, I have three sort of means for my y observable, right? Two of them are low. Eight, one around 800, 880, and then I have this one around 1100, which is sort of this extraordinary regime. Um, and I can also look at my transition matrix, which is going to describe how one state travels to another. Um, and what do I see here if I look at this, right? So why is it three by three? Because I have three states, and the transition matrix describes the probability of transitioning from any one of those three states to any one of the other three states. Um, Interestingly here, I can see I have a very challenging data set because some of these transition probabilities are zero, right? And in particular, the possibility of um, transitioning from either of these top two states to the third state is zero. Why is that? Because here's the third state, um, and it's, it only observes in one direction, right? It only observes going from that top state down and sort of exiting that regime. It doesn't observe an entrance into that regime. So we would need to have domain knowledge to know, is that reasonable? Or if it's not reasonable, is there some sort of constraint on our fitting algorithm we would want to put in to not permit things to go to zero? So those are sort of more advanced things you might do on your own with domain knowledge, but that's not something you're going to get out of the box. So also keep in mind with all these methods, there are ways you can tweak them to reflect your data dynamics. But otherwise, as a general solution, they're going to fit the data they see. So if it never, ever, ever sees that event, it can very well go to zero if you don't constrain it not to. And maybe that makes sense. Um, so on the other hand, you can say, well, that's very flexible because what it shows is it can accommodate both sort of normal regime shifting and also extraordinary events. And maybe that's interesting and helpful to know, unlike, say, an ARIMA model or even a structural time series, which will struggle more with that sort of sudden regime shift. Uh, we can also see that from there, if we look at the, the first two rows and columns, we can see sort of the probability of switching between the sort of two more normal states. And that sort of seems to flicker back and forth uh, with you know, directionality favoring one more than the other, it's not 50-50, and that's sort of an interesting insight. Maybe if we are into hydrology, we might say, oh yeah, that reflects the data, and that's something I can pursue in my research, and so on. So we get some insights here. Um, what I talked about, this is just a local maximum, not a global maximum, so you're not guaranteed to get the same fit if you initialize differently, and so on. It's just one set of parameters. You would want to run this simulation many, many times with different starting conditions um, to really have a better sense of how you're describing this data. And arguably, with just 100 data points, there's only so much you can get out of it anyway, right? And this is, this is where some of these modern methods, they don't always um, 
work as well as you might like with just 100 data points, but it's a simple, simple toy example. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a break. We'll make this, um, I want people to have enough time to go get some snacks, so I think we'll make it like a 10 minute break. Uh, it's the big snack break. Um, and there's also an exercise should you wish to attempt it, so I will quickly show you guys this when we get back, and then we will move on to machine learning methods. So uh, let's see, it's 10 o'clock exactly, so we'll restart at 10.10. And just to clarify, the snacks are just where breakfast was, so across the courtyard, sort of that way. Okay, so we're gonna get started again. Uh, first, I'll just quickly walk us through the last exercise from the hidden Markov model component, and then we're gonna move on to uh, an overview of machine learning for an hour, and then um, last hour will be on deep learning. And I keep panicking when I see my East Coast timestamps. So it's like, oh crap, it's 11 already? No, okay. Okay, so uh, just one other function I wanted to make you aware of is that you can sample from a hidden Markov model once you have fit it. Um, and you don't even need to fit one. You can also feed in parameters and create a hidden Markov model with a certain set of parameters. So that can be useful if you just wanna see, well, what would something look like and run many iterations of it um, to test out a theory. So in this case, I sample from the model we just developed and then I can plot it and think, well, that, that's what I would look like or that, that's what one sort of sampling of this would look like. But then if we were to refit it, notice that this looks very different from our data, right? Even though it's the same hypothesized underlying process. So keep in mind that a process uh, with a certain set of mu's and sigma's to describe your y sub t probabilities and your transition matrix can still give you data that looks very different. Uh, so if we were to then to refit, um, we, we see it like a, a totally different model where the three states are different as well. And in this case, we're actually seeing um, what it, it really looks like here is what happened is that our two sort of normal states were the ones that really got repeated sam uh, sampled from repeatedly. We didn't really get to that third extraordinary state that characterized the beginning of our flow model. Uh, so in this case, um, we're, we're seeing a transition matrix where uh, the probabilities don't look at all like what we saw in our first case, mainly because now it's taking what was our two states out of our three states, and it's remodeling just those two states as three. So here's an example of, um, it's not necessarily wrong or a bad thing, but just to keep in mind that the same hidden Markov model that can describe one set of data can look very different with a different set of data, such as if one of your states is not even there, right? So if you uh, give it too many states or too few states relative to ground truth, you can end up with things that don't make a great deal of sense or aren't very insightful. So just keep that in mind when you're fitting these models, especially if you have these sort of outlier states that you don't see very often. Okay. Um, so any questions or comments on hidden Markov models before we switch gears? Okay. So th those are that's sort of your overview of state space models. Um, so... As a recap, once I load this, as a recap for our state space models, they can be really good for when we have some sort of underlying sense of what we think the dynamics of the system are. They can sort of add evidence to those dynamics or um, at the same time they can take away evidence, right? They can tend to refute what we think. For example, we saw that having a trend in the, um, the Earth temperature data actually wasn't that interesting and more just a local level model sufficed and it also helped us discover seasonality that we had been too lazy to discover on our own. And then with our hidden Markov model, we saw this model can accommodate things like say an extraordinary state change but in such cases, we will run into problems with simulation. So there are problems. These methods need to be treated uh, carefully and with knowledge of how they work. You can't just roll them out out of the box. But they do offer a lot of things that, say, traditional statistical models don't offer, such as a way to sort of break down the system and try to get inside, right? So even though we only have a univariate measurement, we can actually um, get at very complex dynamics underneath that univariate method. And also just to point out, all of these methods can also accommodate multivariate time series data as well. So if you have parallel temperature measurements and you want to incorporate them, or parallel measurements in a hidden Markov process that are all indicative of the same underlying state, or maybe a multivariate state of some kind, that can all be accommodated as well with standard uh, software. And then somebody was asking me during the break, well, what about um, you know, your underlying restrictions, such as I mentioned, you might want to have um, you might want to have a transition matrix that does not permit a zero transition probability because you know that's just not true in your system. 
You can build in things like that. In my experience, most of the time, that will require hacking the source code or writing your own source code. Um, the good news is that these are open source tools, so you have a lot of inspiration slash code you can steal from to like make your own thing. Um, and the other good news is that the underlying algorithms, such as the Viterbi algorithm or the Baumwelch algorithm, um, I think they're complicated in the sense that there are many, many indices, but they're not rocket science in the sense of it's all fairly intuitive and easy to reason about. Um, so it is fairly straightforward to hack this um, once you've sort of developed that sense of how it's working. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about machine learning for time series, uh, switching emphases a little bit, but uh, a different way of understanding our data or processing our data. Okay, so the first thing we need to think about when we do machine learning for time series is the fact that um, I'm not aware of, call my attention to if you can think of one, uh, a machine learning method that's really sort of developed for time series. In my experience, when you apply machine learning to time series, you are applying more general methods and finding a way to make them reflect or accept time series data, as opposed to the models we've just been looking at, which were built from their core around the idea of a time series, right? So traditional models like ARIMA, but also models like hidden Markov model and structural time series at their core envision sort of temporally ordered data. On the other hand, when we get to things like decision trees, uh, those do not fundamentally build the model around this idea of temporal notions, right? Actually, that is completely absent from the model. So if we are going to use models like that, we need to provide a way of translating this temporal data into something that makes sense and can be accepted as an input to that algorithm, but also uh, makes sense, right? So we don't want to get overly focused on the inputs. We also want to make sure that these are sensible inputs and we're not just throwing data at it. So that's why, for example, we would never just say, well, let's make our time series the inputs to our decision tree, right? Let's have a decision tree, and maybe I have a really short time series. It's, you know, it's just 10 points. It's from time one to time 10. So I have plenty of machine learning models that take more than 10 inputs, so why don't I just put the inputs in and, and see what happens? Um, it's very, very rare that that's going to get you anything like what you want. If you have that sort of time series data, arguably it's so predictable and so clean and so easy that you don't need machine learning anyway. You could probably just eyeball it, right? So if you have that kind of data with so little noise and such clear structure, you're, there's no reason to be doing that. So any case where that would work is not a case where you would need to do it. Um, on the other hand, what are some things that could be difficult, right? Your time series can be different lengths. And also things don't sort of, let's say even a really simple example, maybe we always have many time series of a volcano erupting. So we know there's always an eruption somewhere in the data. That's how we've defined this data set. That eruption won't occur at the exact same moment though, right? In one time series, it might be at time step three. At another, it might be at time step 13. So how could you expect a machine learning algorithm with no notion of time to sort of understand that this eruption can occur at any of these times, but that once it does, we expect whatever collateral damage results or whatever shows up in the time series. So again, main message, you can't just feed your time series to a, a machine learning network. I have never seen a case where that makes sense, although if, if someone has one, that would be great to know about. So what we do instead is we have to do feature generation, right? And this is no different. You have to do that in um, cross-sectional data too as well sometimes. Uh, you can generate you know, data off of your raw data, but with time series, it's basically um, required. And so what sorts of features do you want, right? What are we doing when we do feature generation? We're finding a way to take something like this curve and just have a few numbers that des describe what it looks like. And that's no different from any other time we'd want to do feature generation. It's no different from whenever we want to summarize a complex situation with a couple of words or a couple of numbers or a mix and some heterogeneous data. So in this case, we're looking at a time series, and what are we going to use? Well, we might use the maximum value, the minimum value, the median, the mean, the number of peaks. Um, as you may be noticing, these already, if you have sufficiently long time series, and now remember, we're sort of, each time series is almost like its own data point now. So for each time series, you're gonna need to go through each time step in that time series and compute these things. And if you think about that, that actually gets to be quite computationally taxing, right? Because to even just look at the mean or the min or the max, I need to go through every data point. So if I have really long time series, you know, order n or order n squared gets to be quite a drag. Um, and then if I'm doing things like number of peaks, well, that's, this is one of these things where you know, a human eyeball is great at this. A deep learning network of the right kind might be great at this. 
Um, but if I'm just trying to write simple Python routines, and especially efficient ones, I don't know of a very quick and fast and super reliable way to identify these peaks, right? So that's the sort of thing that would be really helpful if we could put it into a feature. But we need to do that sort of cost-benefit analysis of how well, for my data, can I analyze this, you know, um, and also the computational cost. So that's always something you're thinking about with feature generation is just how expensive it can be and whether it's worth it. I also want to point out that time series uh, features are a well, well studied, uh, very complicated, domain dependent sort of thing as far as what turns out to be useful when. Hold on, let's go back. What am I blocking here? There we go. Uh, so this set, I just wanted to highlight, it's one of many canonical sets. It's called the Catch-22 canonical set. So um, this is sort of an ongoing, really interesting project. Uh, it's part of this project called the Highly Comparative Time Series Analysis Project. And what they are doing is collecting every kind of time series data they can get their hands on at all frequencies from whatever domains are available, and you can donate data sets. And the idea is to use machine learning itself to sort of identify what features perform well across many kinds of data sets for classification and prediction tasks as appropriate. And so this is the list of 22 features that these researchers came up with. There's also sort of an alternative version where it's down to 17 features rather than 22. But anyway, the point is, is if you're interested in sort of what's going on, sort of cutting edge feature generation uh, research or what people might use out of the box, you could have something like this. Now, on the other hand, I might say 22 is a really high number. So sure, if you're doing sort of high throughput uh, feature generation of many data sets just to sort of try to develop insights about what kind of features apply universally, great. On the other hand, if you have a very specific use case, like an EKG or um, some kind of um, seismological measurement over time in LA when they have a massive earthquake or whatever, this should not be your first go-to, right? So this is for a very general uh, time series, but almost always if you have domain knowledge or just have looked at your data, you can do better than just a generic feature set, but it's there if you need it. It's also, as I was just mentioning, very discipline specific and sort of the more you know about the underlying processes, the more meaningfully you can identify uh, features. So on the left, I have an EKG again. Um, I love this example because it's periodic. Uh, it has all sorts of interesting features. So these are sorts of things, for example, that doctors see in their medical textbooks. And this is how they learn to read this time series, right? It's actually a time series. And part of what they're doing when they do diagnostics is to do feature generation, right? Effectively, what they're doing is identifying things like, oh, the tall peak, how tall is that? And you know, how long before the first peak and the tall peak? And what's the temporal distance between like that last little dip and the first peak and so on? And that's part of how they diagnose um, heart illnesses, right? So they, they know what's relevant. And so if you were working on data like this, you would probably want to work closely with a physician rather than you know, developing all of these from scratch, right? That would, that would sort of be a waste of time. Um, and then on the right, I have a case of astronomical data. That's another discipline where time series features are actually very well developed. There are whole Python packages just on astronomical time series feature generation. So if that's something you do, that's where you'd want to start out looking. So you should always start with your discipline specific stuff. Um, once you have your time series features, and we're going to compute some features, what can you do with them? Well, one thing you can do is classify your time series data. So here's an example um, from the time series classification database. They show sort of 24 different classes of time series data. And so one thing you can think of is if I have a whole sample of different time series, how would I separate them out like this? Um, and so we're going to be looking at two ways of thinking about that. We're going to use random forest, and we're going to use uh, gradient-boosted trees. But just in case anyone's not familiar, what is a decision tree? A decision tree looks like this, right? A decision tree is something like you feed in your features of your data, and you look at one feature at a time to sort of make decisions branching on this decision tree, branch down, branch down, branch down. And at the end, after you've made a series of decisions that are sort of binary yes, no about various features, you get to either a classification label or a regression prediction, right? So these are wire trees helpful in general. Uh, they can capture nonlinear dynamics. They are also often fairly resistant to sort of extraneous garbage inputs. So you can also be a little bit less judicious about sort of feeding everything in. And sometimes you won't be too punished. But of course, no one's going to actively advocate for that. It's just good to remember. 
Um, and they can also give you, give you a sense, you can read them, right, and start getting sort of a, a sense of how things work. So I imagine even a doctor, when they're looking at an EKG, that's sort of how they think, right? That's how they're trained even. They have these heuristic decision trees, and that's just like our decision trees in machine learning. So the two uh, techniques we're going to use that are based on trees is one, the random forest, right, where we just build a whole bunch of trees, each one sort of built off a subset of features and a subset of data, and we do majority voting, and the winner is, you know, the majority winner. <laughs> And we're also going to use XGBoost. I'm guessing folks have at least heard of XGBoost or gradient boosted trees. The idea is so with a random forest, you build however many trees you're going to build, and they're all in parallel with some sort of random subset of the data and the features, um, and you build off of that. Gradient boosted trees are built sequentially. So first you build your best decision tree with whatever your parameters are. Your second decision tree is then built off the errors of the first decision tree. So each decision tree is sort of trying to correct the errors of the previous one with the idea that you're going to add the inputs, right? So it's not sort of a majority consensus, is that everyone contributes their little bit, you add up the trees and you're good. Um, there's no reason, at least to my mind, when I think about why this should work so well that it does for time series specific data, uh, but empirically in the last sort of three-ish years, um, maybe even a little bit more, it's become clear that XGBoost is very successful at time series tasks, much more so than sort of earlier uh, applications of machine learning to time series. So that's why I highlight it. It's just empirically true when you look at competitions or industry use cases. Um, also clustering, this is the other thing we're going to do in this notebook. So again, I'm guessing folks are familiar with the concept, but just in case you're not, Generally speaking, what does clustering look like? It looks like you, you look at sort of the feature space of your data, be it time series data or uh, cross-sectional data, and you hope somehow that the features sort of cluster in this way that indicate their sort of specific types of data points, and you hope that that somehow means something more fundamental about what has produced that data. That's a beautiful picture. Does anyone actually see that picture at work, though? I mean, I, I want your job if you do, right? That's, that's not really what you see. What you usually see is something on the right, and you're sort of squinting at it and running your analysis, and that also tends to be true for time series data. So we also have to keep in mind uh, the messiness of real world data. Uh, this, I think this picture is a somewhat fair version of a really nice time series, right? So if we were to cluster, this is what it looks like in the time series case, right? Like we could see that those top two curves, 12 and 11, they look similar, right? They've both got three bumps. Uh, they're sort of in the same space positionally. They seem to have approximately the same sort of volatility over time. If we look at 10 and 9, the gray, um, that's an even better case of, yeah, they look pretty similar, but you know, some of them even have features that the other one doesn't. So again, it gets a little more complicated and you start thinking, well, what's good enough? What isn't good enough? Um, if we look at the green, 7, 8, Seven, eight, and six, those also are um, another good case where you start wondering, you know, um, how good is good enough? That might be a little bit more like real life where, you know, there's, there's, there's some sort of commonality. You don't even know if you could write code to identify what that commonality is. Uh, so you, get, you see where it can be difficult to generate features, especially if we want to have features that are robust for all of these time series at the same time, right? Because, of course, all of these are jumbled together. We need to identify features that would distinguish among these. Not really easy, right? Like number of peaks? Well, number of peaks, my blue versus my brown, they might end up being the same, or even my brown versus my gray at the top. You know, depending on what sort of peak finding code I write, the gray and the brown could both have three peaks and come out being very similar. And what does that mean? So you have to have some domain knowledge again and also sort of look at your data. So time series clustering is surprisingly difficult, right? Um, Conceptually, I think it can also be difficult sometimes because we're st we might be looking at it via the features, but ultimately I think what we most want is we want to look at the original raw series and make sure that looks similar, right? We, we have this intuitive sense of if I can eyeball it and it looks similar, that's what I want to come up together in a cluster. It's very computationally costly. Um, as I mentioned, the feature generation itself is very computationally costly because you have to go through the whole time series to come up with a few features, and then that's just one data point. Because now, remember, again, your time series, a whole time series, like one of those curves, is just one data point, right? So if each of these curves is actually a 1,000 measurements, that's you know thousands and thousands to only produce actually 12 inputs, right, 12 samples. So keep that in mind as opposed to cross-sectional data. Uh, one pitfall I want to point out is you might say, well, forget feature generation. Why don't I just measure the distance between curves, right? And I could do something like use Euclidean distance. 
you almost never want to use Euclidean distance, and we're actually going to uh, cover a really great example of why, and I'll introduce another distance metric that works a lot better. Uh, and then time series clustering is used across many disciplines, so that's good to be aware of. As I mentioned, medicine, right, looking at an EKG. Uh, also in finance, especially sort of 1980s style finance, people used to plot things and then say, oh, does this month look like that month from the 60s and maybe the same thing is going to happen with that Kodak stock or whatever. Um, that definitely happens a lot less now, but it was a tried and true method back in the day. Uh, chemistry also, like I talked about, the NMR spectra, right? It's effectively, when chemistry professors send their grad students out and tell them to go take those spectra, that's what they're doing, right? Does it look more like this one or more like that one, and how can we cluster? And, and so on. There are more examples as well. Here's a practical example. This is, I, I don't even know this person, but I've always admired this blog post they did. So basically what they did is they looked at Washington, D.C. They looked at the bike use per hour daily for all days of the week for all bike rental uh, spots. So I don't know, if, I'm guessing Austin has something like this too, but you know you sort of dock the bike, you're a member, you take the bike to another dock. And they looked at the traffic for when bikes were being taken out of different spots, and they basically identified three kinds of stations, right? So there was the one that was busy both at the beginning of the day and at the end, there was one that was busy only at the end of the day, and there was one that was busy only at the beginning of the day. And what they concluded was this sort of showed some kind of pattern of people's movements both to go to work and also sort of where they go after work, because apparently often they don't go straight home or we would have only the double bump situation. Um, so there's plenty of examples of fairly clean time series clustering in the wild. I think that's especially true for sort of human behavior because we have these, it turns out, really boring patterns like we go to work, we come home from work. It's actually really boring if you look at human data. Uh, a little bit noisier if you look at things like astronomical data or financial time series and that sort of thing. But sometimes you get really beautiful clustering. Um, and then finally, yes, okay, finally, last uh, overview. So I just want to talk about the distance metric we are going to look at for time series, which is called dynamic time warping. This is going to be an alternative solution to that uh, clustering problem, right? So I highlighted how you might generate features. And features might work well if you're looking at sort of one particular class of time series, but it can be very difficult to generate features that are robust across many different classes of time series within the same data set. So another option that people have come up with that's quite computationally taxing but works pretty well is called dynamic time warping. So what you can see here, imagine these solid curves are my two time series I'm trying to line up. Basically what it does is it tries to find, it tries to keep them parallel but find a way to maximize sort of the goodness of fit. So you can almost think of it as trying to project one onto the other and you give yourself leeway to sort of come up with the best time projection which means you can sort of expand or contract time on one of your axes in order to enhance your fit. And the nice thing about this is that this tends to correspond pretty well with what we do visually without having to actually do the image analysis, right? So this looks at it, and just like we can sort of squint and we can see the two, uh, the two peaks at the beginning and, and in our brains we want to match them up, that does that computationally. So we're going to revisit that and see what that looks like. So that's an overview of what we're going to do in the notebook. So now let's go to notebook number three. So we're going to go out of the state space into the machine learning. And we'll start with trees for clustering or classification and prediction. OK, so uh, the data set we're going to start with is a data set that's available via the cesium library, and it is um, an EEG data set, so that's for the brain rather than the heart, and I'm sure somebody in this room knows a ton about it, so feel free to pipe up if you have um, any sort of input. Always interesting. Uh, so we visualize this, and we see that there, we can even sort of qualitatively see a difference between three uh, samples. We can see at the bottom there's sort of one highly volatile sample. This is sort of all over the place, and then the, the top two are sort of less volatile. It's not just the volatility, though. If we look, we also spot uh, just differences in the values, right? So the top plot looks like it might be sort of Gaussian around zero, and it has sort of a range of like minus 100 to 100. The second plot, if we were to just look at it visually, doesn't look that different from the top plot, but if we look at the values, this one only ranges from 0 to minus 100, right? So the actual values in this case seem to be some kind of tip-off of the classes. And then again, if we look at the last one, this might be sort of Gaussian, hard to know from this. 
But we see the range is also quite different, 500 to minus 500, right? So already we can spot that we'd want to find ways to sort of preserve information about the values if we were thinking about generating features. As far as what kind of data we're looking at, we're looking at NumPy arrays served within a dictionary. And they're giving us times, measurements, and classes. So that's something to be aware of. Um, the measurements themselves are a list. And it looks like we've got 500 samples. And then if we look at just one of those samples, it's 4,097 points long. So you already get a sense of, oh my goodness. So if I have 500 time series, and each of them has 4,097 points, you see already how it gets to be a little bit computationally taxing just to go through all of that. Uh, so next, if we generate features, feel free to go ahead and hit that button if you want. Um, at least on my rinky-dink laptop, this takes a really long time. So I'm just going to load it up from prepared data. Um, so that's the code I did write. And what did, I, uh, what did I extract? I extracted the amplitude, the percent that's beyond one standard deviation, right? So a measure of like how many outliers we have and how spread out they are the percent close to the median, right? Some sort of measure of how tightly it's hewing to those central values. Uh, the skew in the distribution, and also the max slope, which is sort of how much it jumped up or down, absolute value from one data point to another. How did I find these features? Well, I just looked, I looked at my data a little bit, thought what will fit reasonably well, and then I looked at the cesium documentation and I generated those. Uh, so here you can see if you did just load it up from the CSV, this is what you see. And what do we see? We see some sort of reasonable variation. Um, and if we look at the shape, what is the shape now? It's just 500 by 6. And actually, one of those is just the, the channel. So it's not even relevant. But I've digested 5, 000, or 500 times 4,000 points down to 500 by 6 points, right? So if I'm in a rinky-dink laptop situation in particular, or if I'm not, but I have some enormous time series database and still need to compress it down, this is a way to do that, right? I've really shrunk my data down. Um, we're going to skip this exercise of validating slash calculating these features, but I just want to point out that you can, right? So Cesium, Cesium is this feature generation library. It is not the only one. There are plenty of Python feature generation libraries. Some of them are general purpose, like I talked about that Catch-22 data set. They have this general purpose library. Um, and some of them are specialized, such as I mentioned, there are astronomical time series feature generation libraries. Um, it's good to know these libraries are available, especially for things like these features. I can absolutely write out the code for these features, which I did here, but it's a pain in the butt, right? For sort of standard things like calculating the skew or calculating the max slope, um, why should I hand code those all, right? So especially in the exploratory um, component, I might want to just farm that out to an existing library. Uh, so you can check on your own time that indeed the features we calculate match the features um, that are produced by the algorithm. I just check for one data point. And we can also sort of think, okay, well, are these meaningful? So one thing I did, for example, is did a histogram of the amplitude feature by class. And it looks like at least for one class, right, one class at least distinguishes itself compared to the other. So, okay, there's at least some preliminary evidence that some of these features will help to distinguish classes, which is what I want to do. Okay. Uh, so these are, these are some other examples of plotting histograms to, again, check, are these features I generated somewhat useful? And, in fact, you can go through quite a bit of feature importance analysis. Um, by the time you're doing that for time series, it's just like how you would do it for cross-sectional data, right? Do the features I'm producing tend in some way to correlate with the outcome I'm interested in, be that a classifier or a forecast or whatever it is? So you definitely would want to go through and check that they're sensible. Um, you also, ultimately, if you have a well-developed set of features, you probably at some point would want to code them yourself, right? So I mentioned Cesium or other feature generation libraries are useful in the sense of why should I code up the same things repeatedly. There's a few solutions to that. One is if you do this enough, you'll just have your own library, which is even better because you really know it line by line and you know how it works. Um, ultimately, if you have a really well-developed set of features, you also don't want to use an out-of-the-box solution because that's coded to be very general. If I, on the other hand, know the same three features I always calculate, one thing to keep in mind is sometimes features can be calculated together to cut down on computational costs, right? So if I'm looking at min and max, there's no reason to do one pass through the data to find the max and then another pass through the data to find the min, right? So you might want to group 
all things that go through the whole data in the same way and do them all together. That's not something a feature generation library will do for you. Um, I have not yet seen an example, though I'd love if anyone has one, of somebody sort of coding things up to take advantage of those. Um, that would be a great contribution to the open source community if anyone wants to, but in the meantime, be aware of that. Uh, because even in this really tiny uh, data set, I found I had to wait quite a while to generate the features, right? So this can blow up very quickly, and you don't want to spend whole afternoons at work sort of sitting there waiting for features that may not even be very useful. Okay, so that's the feature generation. It can be quite straightforward. Uh, should be domain specific, but in this case, we sort of went with a few common sense features, and we're going to see how they work. So we prepare a training and a test set, and let's roll out a random forest classifier. We're going to use 10 estimators, a max depth of three, uh, set a seed for no particular reason. We're just saying, OK, how does this random forest do? So if we fit it and score it on our training data, we've got like a 62%, 63% accuracy. Uh, the good news is our test data is not much lower, so it doesn't seem like we overfit. It seems like we have a reasonably um, reasonably generalized model. Um, and if we look sort of at what came back, it also looks reasonably well distributed. So we have five classes. They're all um, sort of distributed in our underlying test data. So that's um, something interesting to know when we're thinking about our possible null model, right? So when you think about is 62% a good accuracy, of course, you want to think about, well, what would even a really dumb model do, right? So if we have five five classes, a dumb model would not be doing 60% accuracy, right? So it's just some sort of sanity test that our uh, data is indeed doing something. So that's our random forest, right? It, it's just to point out, okay, you can put some features in and get a classification that is far better than a random classification with just five features. So I boil it down essentially 4,100 data points to five data points without even much exploration, and I could already do something, right? So time series uh, classification, is not that hard to get some kind of result that is better than random, and that really boils a whole data set down to just a few numbers. And it depends, of course, on the quality of the data and what you're looking at. Okay, so now we're gonna run through the exact same analysis just with XGBoost instead, right? So now I'm gonna use an XGBoost classifier. Uh, I'm gonna, again, use 10 estimators and max depth of three. I'm gonna fit that, <coughs> and I'm gonna score that. Uh, and what I see now is I have improved right away on my random forest model. This is, um, as a rule of thumb, quite expected with time series. So as I was mentioning, XGBoost and gradient boosted trees tend to do extremely well on time series data uh, relative to what had been there before. So that's something to keep in mind, although of course here we do see a little bit of evidence of overfitting, so I might want to prune that back. And as a reminder, what you get with XGBoost that you don't get uh, automatically with a random forest is some measure of feature importance. So if you were iterating and thinking about, OK, well, what features turned out to be useful, especially if you don't want to go through all the time series and plot them all. If you don't have time for that, or if the time series are just so noisy that the visual is not giving you much information, you can use something like feature importance as one way of thinking about what kinds of features are useful. And then you might look and say, OK, so feature 0 is useful. And what was feature 0 anyway? If I go all the way back up, what was that? Dut, 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 dut. Uh, so that was the amplitude, right? And that was actually one of the things that jumped out at us. So if it says amplitude is useful, right, these indicators of sort of the numerical range is useful, one thing I might do to improve this model is say, OK, well, what other sorts of features provide similar a complementary information, right? So maybe in addition to the amplitude, um, maybe I need to add the mean or something like that to provide more information. So you can use this as a way of sort of learning also for this kind of data what is useful. So that's classification. We also want to think about forecasting though, right? So in this case, we're going to take a look at the air passengers data set, which I highlighted in a slide uh, at the beginning of the lecture. So we're going to load the air passengers data set. Uh, take a look at what this looks like. So here we can see we've got monthly data going back to 1949. Um, set our index and take a look at what that looks like. Let's plot it. And so here we can see the plot. Uh, there's definitely some seasonal component, and there's also some trend component. It's going up. Now, if we were uh, doing, say, ARIMA modeling, we would definitely need to make this stationary. 
that's not a per se requirement with something like machine learning, but it is generally a good idea, right? So some of the same considerations about what your data looks like for traditional statistical models are still things you can do to make your data cleaner and easier to digest uh, for a machine learning model. So let's think about log transforming this and also diffing it. So if we do that, uh, we get uh, a time series that is more uniform in its variance and values, right? Which has to be a good thing because basically what we're doing is making all the subseries from this time series more comparable, right? Because what we're going to do effectively to do some learning here is we're going to slice the time series. So this one time series is going to provide us many different options and many different samples by having a sliding window, right? So this could be one sample. This could be another sample. This could be another sample. Because in this case, I have one baseline time series. I'm going to convert that into many samples for my machine learning algorithm. So here's where we see another difference compared to a statistical model or a state-based model. In the statistical or state-based model, the model for inputting your data is you have one long time series and you throw that in. On the other hand, with machine learning, the model has nothing to do with being aware of this temporal component of the data. So instead, we take different time windows, we chop up our time series, and those become different samples. So that becomes a way to use one time series and just model that one time series for machine learning. So why is this different from what we just did with classification? Because we're trying to forecast, and we're trying to forecast one series in particular. If we had many time series, then that would be a different consideration. Do we want each time series to just be one sample? Or even in that case, do we want to chop up each of those time series into subsamples and use them all? But in any case, what you want to make sure you do, since you're going to be doing a sliding window across here, is you would like to make all these data points as comparable to one another as possible. Because if you think about a machine learning perspective, right, the, the machine learning algorithm just sort of sees a slice here and a slice here, and it has no way of sort of knowing which dynamics should be carried around forward or which dynamics are unique to a particular aspect. Whereas if you give it this, they're all clearly more comparable to one another thanks to those transformations. And then you would just need to make sure to transform back at the end when you wanted to check your predictions. So we're going to have a time series that is the diff of the log of these values. And now as an exercise, I'm going to ask you to think about now that we have one time series and we have it in a form where sort of all components of the, of the full range of time look very similar, how can we convert that to many samples? So take a couple of minutes and think about how you would chop this up to create different sub-time series as samples. OK, so let's take a look at this together. Um, what I decided to do, and, and there's no reason that this is especially great or anything, but I decided to break it up into 12 months, so to sort of look at a, a year at a time, a slice. Now, arguably, that's not so great because you can't really capture the seasonality if you just have one sample of the season. But I said, what the heck, that's what I'm going to do. So um, 12 steps. I think what 12 steps does give you the opportunity to do, though, is maybe at least be able to pinpoint where in, where in the seasonal cycle you are when it's looking at many many examples, whereas if you have too few months, you probably can't spot that at all. So that was part of the rationale. Um, and then what I did was I wanted um, first to just give it, I pre-allocated this array of vowels. So if we look at this, it's 143 by 12. So basically, I've just stacked the time series 12 times because I'm going to want 12 time steps. And then what I do is I'm just going to lag it. And I'm sure there's a, a more elegant way to do this. I used a for loop, just you know, my, my janky solution, and then I don't have to think too hard about it. And basically, I just, for each column, I shift it up by however many lags I want, right? Because I want the first value to be 12 months in the past relative to the last value, because I want to move forward in time. So if I do this, then I get this vowels. So now I have only 132 by 12. So why did I go from 143 samples to 132 samples? Well, I lost the samples where I don't have a full 12 months, right? So at the very beginning of the time series, I don't have those you know, 12 months, right? I have to go 12 months into the time series to even have one subsample of a time series. So if I look at that, I can then look at, say, the last n steps of my time series, right? So that's, that's this time series I depicted uh, up above, right? So my last... My last 12 steps are these last values, right? The 12 last values of the global time series. And that becomes the last sample now that I have broken my time series into individual windows, right? So vowels minus one is just my last sample that I'm going to in some way process for a machine learning algorithm. 
And notice th these are the same values, right? So I basically, I converted this box of, say, the last 12 samples. That's now sort of one sample time series. Uh, one thing I hope you noticed is that I could actually have more samples. Right now I only have 132. What would be some ways to have more? Or at least I can think of one way. Uh, let's see. So minus 2. They do overlap. So if you look, see I have minus 167 minus 09, and then minus 167 minus 09 here. Um, but actually, that's a fantastic point. And when I do my deep learning example, that was like my trick there was that we don't have overlapping and we could, right? So if I have chopped it up to have non-overlapping time windows, that's kind of silly. If I think I want more time series, I should just have a sliding window, um, which is actually what I've done in this case, the way it was coded up, just by lagging one at a time rather than chopping them up. Whereas if I had done, say, a reshape, then I certainly wouldn't have had overlap and I would have had to put, a, put that back in. So I do, have, um, I, don't, I do have overlap already, so I'm using each point as much as I can. Um, I guess the thing I want to point out is if I reduced my number of steps, I could get a couple of more time points out of there, right? So if I had only six steps instead of 12, I would get six more sequences. Um, most of the time that won't matter. Maybe in such a small set it might matter, so that's something to think about. Um, another thing you could think about, uh, less used in machine learning compared to uh, deep learning, but you could think about doing some data augmentation if you have some domain knowledge to think about ways to augment your data in a way that's realistic. Okay, so that's how I prepare my data. So I've just created shorter time series. I haven't actually created features yet, right? So with forecasting, we have this additional step of first we take our long series and we break it up into smaller series. I still need to featureize, right? I still need to do the same thing I did earlier for the classification. So I'm going to do that here. So I convert my measures to a list because that's what cesium expects, right? So I've got my list of measures. Um, and each measure is this 11 time, 11 time steps long. And then I'm going to featureize. This one I'm going to run through just so you guys can see. Um, this one is, is small enough. I can actually do it. But as you can see, at least on my uh, rinky-dink laptop, it still takes a while, right? So even this really tiny data set, um, that should be instant, but it isn't, uh, in part because this is not a very general library, and in part because time series uh, feature generation is just that slow. So if I look at these columns, what have I got? Uh, I think these are the same features I used above, so sort of a generic set of features. Uh, if I look at the histogram of these, let's see, oh, well, I see it's sort of multimodal. I'm like, wow, that, that's cool. Maybe there's these underlying populations I can get all excited about uh, some possible structure. Uh, similarly, if I look at percent amplitude, I see something that might potentially be multimodal, so that seems like maybe it could be good when I'm uh, going to use a tree to do some kind of regression task. I like multimodal, it suggests there's some sort of meaningful data underneath. So I'm going to run, now I'm going to run, instead of an XGBoost classifier, I'm going to run a regressor. So it's actually the same process. Now that I have converted my inputs to features, it's the same, except now I'm looking for a numerical output to forecast a value. And my Y, instead of being a label, is going to be the forecasted value. So if I do that, and I run my model, Oh, well, look, my, my RMSE is dropping. That's great. Um, on the other hand, RMSE can be hard to digest, right? What does that, what does that really mean? Uh, so I can do a, th a few things. I can do a scatter plot of my test data. Notice I have very little test data because this is a very small data set. Um, you'd never really use machine learning on such a tiny data set, right? So keep in mind in the, you know, your real world application, you would have more points. But that also means you could potentially be waiting many hours to generate your features. So obviously, we're not doing that here. But do keep in mind your feature generation will just sort of blow up. Uh, so if we look at our testing and our even our training doesn't look especially good here. This is really bad, right? I was just telling you guys how amazing XGBoost is and how it has really contributed to machine learning for time series. Um, I even have a negative correlation between uh, my prediction and my actual value. That's really bad, right? That means I'm sort of actively doing worse even than chance. I would do better to just sort of predict zero always rather than run my model. Um, I certainly don't want to tell my boss this. So um, 
exercise for the reader, although you can scroll down and see the answer, but just think for a minute, what, what went so terribly wrong here? Is this, remember, this is, um, this is actually a really easy data set, right? I showed you at the beginning of this whole tutorial the air passengers data and traditional ARIMA did great. So why can't I do anything? So certainly transforming makes it harder, right? And that's actually, um, it's a frequent sort of mistake you see both in um, time series research papers and also blogs, is sometimes people get these amazing R squared values or amazing correlations, but that's mainly because they haven't transformed it. And sure, like most of the prediction just goes into the magnitude, whereas actually the utility of the forecast is sort of that delta. So especially when we diffed it, that makes it into a much harder task because once you diff a time series, predicting the last value for the next one is not a great strategy. Uh, so we have turned it into a harder problem, uh, but actually when you transform it and do an ARIMA model, you'll still get great results. So that is not why, um, that's maybe why we don't get impressive sounding numbers, but that it still should do better than it's doing. So what, what else could have gone wrong? So think about what we did. We sort of, we took a sliding window of um, basically a year's worth of data. <coughs> And then we summarized it with things like amplitude. What else did we use? Let's go back up. Uh, percent beyond one standard deviation, skew, max slope, et cetera. Um, what else could have gone wrong there? So I might buy that, and this is where it can be helpful to have the null model. I might buy this thing of like, oh, well, maybe this data is just not amenable to this analysis. Like, it's, it's evolving so much over time that it's not reasonable to forecast. Um, but I guess I'd have two rebuttals to that, right? One rebuttal is even with our eyes, we can sort of see something. So we should be able to find some technique that uh, uh, can do that. And also, as I mentioned, the ARIMA can do it. So if we even know we have a model already, uh, we know we can do it. Um, that's not apparent once you have the log transform, but any, any algorithm worth its salt should not just not work because we made a transform that makes it more uniform. But absolutely, we should think about those things. I did detrend it, yes. So you could say removing the trend maybe removed all the signal. I think that's one way of, of framing what he said. Um, so that's what I'm saying that could be one possibility if we weren't aware that there is a model that works. And this is especially if you work in fields where actually even the best model is pretty bad, you can have these debates all day and sometimes you just don't know, right? Is it that there's just no signal left or is it uh, that we have a bad model? And that, you know, for some people that's their whole job um, is, is figuring that out or trying to figure that out. Um, and it, it happens a lot in time series. In this case though, they're actually, let me call your attention to this. So we, we didn't really look at our feature set in this case once we computed it. Um, so here's the feature set for my first five data points. And what do you notice here? A lot of the values are the same, right? So, I mean, if this was what I was looking at, rather than, the, say, the picture of the time series, I mean, really, what am I supposed to do with this? The percent amplitude only has two different numbers here. Uh, the max slope has the same number throughout. And if we think about why, right, let's, let's plot three samples of the same data, right? Remember, it's a sliding window. That's the problem, is we have created these points out of sliding windows. But then the data that I have produced tends to just look at things like the amplitude, the numerical qualities, rather than, say, positional qualities, right? So if I look with my eye at these three curves, I can see they're different. They're sort of at different phases of the same cycle. So if I can see sort of that phase information, which is positional information, I'm in a great point. But my algorithm right now is not seeing anything that's sort of positional information, like telling me where a peak is. It's only seeing information about numbers, right? But if I'm only looking at these time series along this axis, I'm actually not seeing anything that differentiates these three, right? Along this axis, the value axis, they're no different. And that's part of what I did wrong here, is I only used features that describe sort of the underlying values produced by the process without providing features that describe the temporal structure, right, the structure along this x-axis. 
That turned out to be reasonably okay for the EEG data because there was already so much variation on the numerical axis. We didn't even really need to treat it as a time series, right? We could just sort of summarize the values we saw and we got a reasonable classification. But in this data set, that's not gonna cut it, right? The different samples are not different along their numerical axis, they're different along their positional axis. So let's revisit this and generate features that encode some kind of positional information. So this is just one stab at doing that. Um, basically, we're gonna generate six features, and what are these features that I generated? Let's just read them. Okay, so the first one is np.where the values is equal to the max. So now I wanna know at which time step does the max occur. My next feature is np.where values um, is equal to the min. So now I wanna know at which time step does the minimum occur, right? So now, going back here, those two features are gonna give me information about this axis rather than this axis, because that's what I need to differentiate these samples. Uh, what have I got here? Uh, I've got the distance between the min and the max. And notice it's actually more than distance, it's positional, right? Because if the min occurs before the max versus after, this will be positive or negative, right? So this is giving me directionality of the relationship between the min and the max. Um, I'm also still gonna keep the max in, uh, this might not be that useful, but I figure what the heck, just in case that matters. Um, and now I'm going to take, what am I taking here? I'm taking the last one minus the next to last one. Um, why am I doing that? Well, in this case, I have a really short time series, right? Just 11 steps. And it seems like if I look at the end, the end last few points are where these three distinguish themselves, even though they're sort of neighboring sliding windows. The part where they're most different is at the end, so I'm just saying I want some features to sort of focus on the behavior that occurs here at the end. So that's what I'm doing with these. Again, I'm, I'm sort of blindly throwing these in other than this idea that I need to understand this positional relevance. So let me do this, and then let me make sure these features are different, because if they're not, I'm really in trouble. Uh, but these do appear to be at least a little bit different. Actually, can I look at this at the data frame? It just prints a little prettier. Um, so, you know, it's not great. I'd have 10, 9, 8, but 10, 9, 8 is a heck of a lot better than 10, 10, 10, right? Uh, so we at least go from having columns that are just absolutely identical, which are total garbage for our decision tree, into one where there are at least some meaningful differences, even between quite similar time series, because at the end, those time series have different outputs. Okay, so ah, here we do that. So we're going to divide it up again. Let's fit this again. Um, notice here we've still got our RMSE is about the same, 0.135. What was it up here? Where is it? Doot, doot, doot. 0.138. Uh, so I'm not doing that much better on my RMSE front. Let's do a scatter plot, though. Uh, so here's my test. And let's look at the correlation on my test. Okay, so how do I digest this? So this is my test plot. Let's remember what the first test plot looked like with the total garbage features. I mean, clearly this plot is a lot better, right? So our old plot with the garbage features, it's almost like they're just on independent axes. It's almost like there is no relationship at all between our prediction and our true value. Here, that's not true at all, right? So I think we're seeing a case again where RMSE won't tell you the full story. And that's something you need to keep in mind in general with your time series models. No particular metric is gonna get it right all the time. You wanna take a more holistic view. And it will also depend on your applications, right? So RMSE uh, gives me the same thing for a model that has almost no relationship to my outcome versus one that does, right, if I go by plotting. And I would also point out here, especially if you ignore these two outlier points, and you seem to have even more of a relationship, right? So um, if I do my Pearson R versus my Spearman R, my Spearman R to get rid of a bit of the outliers, uh, the correlation is a little bit less negative, although still negative, right? So this model still needs work. But at least now we're bringing some sense to the data versus before because our inputs were identical for different outcomes. Uh, there was just no way to get started for the algorithm. And if we do a scatter plot for the training, uh, we see that we do even better, right? So as, again, if we ignore that outlier in particular, this begins to look like something of a relationship. Um, and actually, if we ignore the outlier, we might even finally be into the realm of positive correlation. Okay, so. Not super impressive results because, again, we're dealing with a small data set. So actually, this exercise is here to show you a few things, right? Uh, we saw how we can take one time series and turn it into many sliding windows to produce enough separate samples to fit an algorithm, say, for prediction. 
But on the other hand, I think what we see here is A, it can be very easy to generate the wrong feature set and even a nonsense feature set, which is a reason you should be careful about using packages that are automated feature generation. Uh, it could be that your features are not in any way meaningfully distinguishing between, say, neighboring time series, which is something you want to do. Um, but you also want to remember that, especially for low data situations, machine learning is really not the way to go. So if you're doing some sort of forecasting that involves low quantities of data, um, that's not really what machine learning is built for, right, versus something like the ARIMA model is. So part of using machine learning for time series is knowing when to use it judiciously and when you just don't have enough data to justify it. Uh, so all of these techniques should really be used on much, much larger data sets. And if you use them on the larger data sets, that's where you're going to see some really excellent performance. Um, and the larger your data set, the more likely that machine learning is the way to go rather than the traditional statistical models. Because as I mentioned, those do well on small data sets. And then they sort of max out. Your estimation of your parameters can only get so good when you don't have that many. Versus when you have many, many parameters and a more complex model, if you have the data to justify it, you can get really excellent results. Um, and you can see that, for example, in Kaggle competitions, in industry research papers, in academic um, modeling competitions of time series forecasting, XGBoost is performing very well on large volume data. OK, so any questions about machine learning in time series? OK, so uh, can I look at your computer while we take a break? Because we're about to take a break. OK, great. So we're going to take a break. Uh, let's reconvene at 11.20. It's 11.11 now. And we will cover deep learning as our last component. So we have, um, we're going to cover two more notebooks. I do want to uh, briefly cover time series clustering. So I'm going to fly through this. And then we'll get to the deep learning example. Uh, there are two deep learning examples in the notebooks, one on electricity forecasting and one on stock forecasting. The stock forecasting one is sort of um, supposed to be like a you know do it on your own after the tutorial thing. That was because I wanted you to have a TensorFlow example as well as a MixNet example, just because I like those two libraries. Um, but the concepts are the same, so we're going to go through the more interesting example, and then the, the uh, stock prediction example is just a second example with noisier data and with a different framework. So that's just the background. Uh, but let's talk about clustering. Let me just again briefly remind you of the dynamic time warping, just because that's the thing I want to cover. OK, so uh, what we just did, we used, uh, we looked at how we generate features for a time series, what can go wrong there, what can go right there, why we might not want to do it sort of blindly, why we might want to put some thought into it. Uh, we saw that feature generation can be really time consuming. Uh, we learned how to extract many samples from a machine learning perspective samples rather than just one time series to accommodate the nature of how machine learning works and how it thinks in terms of samples rather than in terms of time series. Uh, so now briefly we're going to look at clustering and mainly I want to show you the value of dynamic time warping. So again as a reminder this is one way to map time series to one another in a way that looks sort of more at their shapes rather than at uh, features. So we're going to compare those briefly and see, see how they work. Okay. So in this case, what we are looking at, this is actually from the other tutorial I gave a few years ago. This is sort of a test subset of what are some word projections. This is based off a paper from, I think, the 1990s or early aughts, uh, before we had all this lovely deep learning and where people were thinking, okay, like we scan historical documents. Is there a way to sort of identify which words within the documents are the same. And what they came up with is, let's look at these docu, let's look at a word in handwriting, right? We're looking at sort of historical stuff. Let's project that onto a 1D axis, right? So sort of all the letters on the word, we just do a bin count of the density, convert that to a 1D axis. That is actually an ordered, evenly spaced axis. So it's like a temporal axis, even though it's not per se time. So if we do that, they basically boiled it down to about 207 data points per word. And if we looked at what some of the words looked like, and they don't tell us what word in the classification corresponds to certain handwriting, but we can see there are sort of distinctive shapes, right? Different numbers of peaks, uh, different locations of the peaks. And I also just wanted to point out, sometimes you can just have a different way of summarizing the data, and you almost create a new time series. So this on the left is sort of the time series of the projection of the word. And then on the right, I took a histogram of the values. So basically, I took this, summarized it numerically, 
But you can even think of a histogram as a time series in the sense of your x-axis is, again, evenly spaced, right? So once you start realizing that time series, temporal axis, can be a way to think about shapes of curves more generally, you can think of all sorts of ways to generate features. Um, one really nice way to sort of visualize time series when you want to see many examples of the same sort of class of a time series is you can think about things like producing a 2D histogram. So in this case, we're looking at uh, the word 23. So um, let's see. I believe this, this is word 23. Yeah, this is word 23 here. But that's just one example, right? What if we want to make sure that the features we see here are more general? We can do something like a 2D histogram, and we see, oh, yeah, it looks like there are sort of two peaks here, although the location is not set that specifically, and a couple of peaks going on here. And this is actually a good example of part of the reason we can't just feed the raw time series as the inputs or as the features, right? Because things like peaks, their location jumps around, whereas if we were to just feed it in, that behavior won't really be documented. So we're going to just generate some features, again, off of, um, off of what we've seen recently, briefly. Uh, so again, I used cesium, and again, this is sort of time consuming, so I would recommend just reading it off the CSV. You could, on your own time, possibly consider um, generating them, but it can be quite time consuming. And again, we sort of look at a histogram to get a sense of what these features looks like. Uh, we at least want to make sure we've got some sort of spread. We're going to generate some features for the histogram itself as well, treating that as a sort of directional time series. Um, we're also going to uh, find the location of the max value. So we sort of learned our lesson from that last example we did with the air passengers. Let's put in some sort of positional information that we found ourselves, in this case, where the max is. Um, and then finally, for clustering, we want to make sure all the features sort of count equally, right? So we want to make sure that um, it's not like amplitude just swaps out percent beyond one standard deed, right? So what's a quick way to do this? This is not time series specific, but in general, we want to pre-process our features. Um, and then we're going to cluster them. And in this case, I'm using hierarchical clustering. Why am I doing that? Because I don't really have a good sense of what my distribution looks like, so I don't want to use something like k-means where I'm assuming that I necessarily want to minimize variance and that I have these sort of well-shaped uh, spheres. I don't want to assume anything like that at all. Um, so if I do that, what I'm going to see, this is just sort of the result of my clustering, it looks pretty messy. Like I'm not really finding a good pattern, and one uh, measure of that is like the homogeneity score, right? So like how homogeneous are any of the clusters I made in terms of the original class labels? Um, the punchline is not very good, right? So the clustering I do based on features of my time series, at least for these features, not great. Now I could put in more work and try to find good features, or I could remember, oh, wait, dynamic time warping. I heard about this magical distance metric that's really fantastic. Let me check that out, right? Um, so let's first look at a toy example. Here's my toy example where I proved to you that Euclidean distance is so terrible, right? So here I have two sine curves and just a flat line. Um, I think we would all agree that we would rather match the two sine curves, even if they have sort of different frequencies, we'd rather think of them as being more similar to each other rather than thinking that either is sort of more similar to a flat line, right? So if I were going to group these, say, into only two groups, we'd probably put the two sine curves together, right? There's more fundamental uh, process in common for those two relative to just the flat line. Um, so as an exercise, I would recommend on your own time considering uh, calculating these, but I'll just point out that if we do calculate these, um, both of the sine curves end up having a shorter distance to the flat line than they do to each other. That, you know, there's no magic behind it. That's just you know, sum of squares and take the square root. That's the behavior you're going to get. Super undesirable behavior. So this has two components that concern me. Firstly, it's not super computationally efficient anyway to do Euclidean distance, right? You still need to go through all the data points. It's not like it's really fast. And it's really crap, right? So there's two reasons not to use it. Uh, it's almost always true that you wouldn't want to use Euclidean distance. Another measure that has been recommended is a correlation measure, right? Like how sort of similar are they? Um, how correlated are they? That seems like maybe it could do better than Euclidean distance. Uh, so we're going to do the same thing. In this case, you see that um, I am going to add a little bit of random noise to my time series three, which is the flat line, just so that I don't have an undefined uh, correlation, right? Because if there's no variance, that measure will just come back as a NAN. So let's do the same thing. Let's look at the correlation. So 
huh, interesting. Again, the, the sine curves are sort of negatively correlated with each other uh, versus they both have a positive correlation with the flat line. So again, if I use correlation, A, it's not a super efficient metric anyway, and B, it doesn't do an especially good job relative to my desired behavior. Uh, so what I would recommend is that we do dynamic time warping. Here is one simple implementation. Um, you can definitely code this on your own, so I would definitely recommend this if you're ever going to work with dynamic time warping so that you feel more comfortable with the definition. The meat of it is here, right? So I'm using this. This is the dynamic programming aspect is I have a matrix because basically what I'm trying to do is for each set of points, right, for going up to the ith point on one time series and the jth on another, and they don't need to be unified, I want to figure out what's the way to align them that results in the shortest difference in their values, right? That best aligns their difference. So I do that by iterating. I start at the beginning of time series one and the beginning of time series two, and then I calculate the distance between them. Um, so this is, for example, one thing you can play with when you want to, even dynamic time warping can have many definitions, right? Here I'm just going to use the square of the difference as my distance, and then I want to think, Okay, so the min preceding distance would either be uh, the distance from i minus 1 and j, or the distance from i, j minus 1, or the difference with i minus 1, j minus 1. Remember, these i's and j's are how I'm moving along the temporal axis. And remember, I have disconnected the two axes of my curves, so I can sort of move along one curve but not the other, or move along both, only one step the way I've defined it. But I'm sort of trying to move along the axes in a way, having a path such that my square distance here is at a minimum. So it's sort of this iterative way of working through the data. So what if I move one here but not here, or two here and, but not here, and, and how can I sort of warp these two curves onto each other in the way that makes them fit the best? That's what we're doing. Um, and then ultimately, I return that minimum distance. I take the square root of that thing, and that's what I'm defining as my time, dynamic time warming distance. So now, I sure hope this fixes the problem, or I just wasted a lot of time. So now TS1 to TS2 is 3.7. Uh, TS1 to TS3 is also 3.7. And TS2 to TS3 is 4.16. Uh, so notice, it's still not perfect, right? I still have the problem of my flat line uh, not being as different from my sine curve as I would like. But it's a lot better. At least it's not telling me that my two sine curves are way different from each other compared to the flat line. So um, firstly, dynamic, warming, dy dynamic time warping has a lot of parameters you could tweak. So one thing you might want to do for a particular data set is explore sort of different ways of stepping back and forth, right? So what sort of time steps you'll allow, and different distance metrics to see if maybe you could improve the distinction depending on your underlying data. Um, and then the other thing you might want to do is just accept it at some point in the sense of it is extremely difficult to define differences between time series. And this is where if, if this is not good enough, you might even begin to look into deep learning because at some point you say, okay, it's just an image analysis problem instead and let's you know, ratchet it up a notch. So that's something to keep in mind too. But to the extent we want to keep this as a clustering problem, this is how we want to do it. Um, I also wanted to point out that there are libraries that code this up. So you won't find dynamic time warping in any of the sort of major libraries like sklearn or scipy, unfortunately. But there are all sorts of DIY uh, GitHub, such as this one here. Um, so you can see that actually we have the same definition that they have, um, but this is a much more sophisticated implementation where there are more knobs to turn. So these things are available, but you do have to do a bit of work. Now, if I were to compute this pairwise distance, it is really uh, computationally taxing, so we would be here a while just sitting around. We're not going to do that, uh, but we are going to run through the clustering. Um, and if we look at how the clustering performed now, now we have fantastic um, homogeneity and completeness scores, right? So the extent to which one class is covered by one cluster is really good, and the extent to which one cluster is composed of only one class is also really good. So now we have a really nice one-to-one -one mapping versus if you remember the homogeneity score for just the features was more like 50%. Uh, so your distance metric can make a tremendous difference for time series clustering. And uh, similarly, you can also use these sorts of things for forecasting or classification, right? So for classification, I think it's obvious you would just sort of map something onto the cluster. And if your clusters are quite homogenous, that's already useful. You can also use this for forecasting in the sense of if you have a partial curve, you can say what curve or what time series is this closest to, and then use that time series and its outcome to predict the outcome for your new 
uh, feature. So that's something you see in finance. You see that in health as well, where you're just sort of saying, for example, this patient up to time T, who are they most similar to? And maybe that is you know, a likely outcome for that patient too. And that's really interesting because then you can use um, quite heterogeneous data. You can use really messy data, and you'll get a pretty good result here as, comp as compared to trying to come up with a feature set, which can be quite challenging. So this is an alternative way to do both forecasting and classification. Any questions? OK, great. So we are on to our last component, which is deep learning for time series. So we just have a couple of slides to cover. OK. Uh, so show of hands if you have worked with a, time, a deep learning framework of some kind before, at least on a toy example. OK. So for those who, who haven't, um, I'm going to give like a very brief rundown, but this is in no way a good substitute for reading up on it and, and learning these packages. But I just want to give you a sense of how this would look in a time series um, context. So we start with the simplest of uh, neural network examples, which would be something like a fully connected model. So neural networks are really just a form of machine learning in the sense that they expect a series of inputs and will give you a series of outputs. And they um, are not necessarily time aware, right? They're not looking for give me your time series and I will fit a model to a time series. They are looking for samples, right, x, and outputs. And the beautiful thing, um, just like machine learning, is deep learning is like fairly agnostic. It doesn't really care what inputs you give it, right? To some extent, these have been built as you throw anything you want at it and you may very well get a, a nice answer if you sort of tweak your parameters and you have your training and, and you know, that aspect is a bit of an art. But what does this look like in the simplest model? You have an input layer, which would be, for example, could be features. Uh, so this looks a lot like a decision tree, right? Where we would create our features and then we would input them. And the difference between, say, a decision tree and a neural network is that a neural network will look like this. It will, for example, if you were using a fully connected model, then every input would go through some kind of multiplication with a weight and possibly some sort of activation function. An activation function is essentially just a way of introducing nonlinearity. So you would essentially have like a matrix multiplication coupled with a nonlinearity to produce your next set of inputs into this layer. This layer would do the exact same thing, right? Some sort of matrix multiplication followed by some nonlinear activation and output it. And then at the end, you might have a bunch of new features that have come out through your model and you find some way of combining them to produce your output. Um, that's like, you know, the very, very high level uh, view for those who really have not encountered this before. And obviously, there's a lot that goes into figuring out how you should do that properly, how to initialize it. Um, you very quickly get into the millions of parameters. So we're going to leave all that aside. And there are great tutorials at Sci um, SciPy this week on this topic. So you can learn more. Um, but the main point here is that a fully connected model from a time series perspective is just like another machine learning model. It will still require feature generation and a lot of thought about how to sort of translate your time series into something that this kind of model can digest. So it may very well do better, say, than a decision tree, right? That's sort of an empirical question for a particular kind of data. But this is not in any way time aware, just like machine learning techniques are not in any way time aware. And we have to sort of cut up and pre-process our time into a format that this understands. There are other options, though. So the classic example of how you would put a time series into a neural network is called a recurrent neural network, or RNN. You'll mostly see RNN. And the idea here is what this does recurrent, uh, recognizes that your data will come again and again. Your data recurs. So you build one cell. Here we go one cell, but basically what you do is unroll it and you reapply it at each stage with your new data. So this provides a unifying slash temporally aware way of looking at your data because you have a model that understands it's going to be rolled out and used on the same data. So what does this look like? For a univariate or a multivariate case in each, either example, doesn't matter, you have your existing neural network model. First, you put in your first value of your time series, right? Chug, chug, chug. It produces a hidden state. You don't need to worry about that, but that's part of its sort of internal accounting. Why does it need a hidden state? Well, that's what makes it temporally aware. That's what gives it the ability to sort of remember things from state to state, right? Rather than in this example where it just gets something and chugs out one response and there's no time. Here, this model itself has a temporal axis, right? It produces its hidden state. Then you put in your next value. It remembers its hidden state. 
that affects what goes on in here, and now comes a new hidden state. So your model has some form of memory or some way of evolving over time, recognizing that your data wants something that recognizes dynamics that are evolving over time. So recurrent neural networks, um, just like everything else we've talked about today, not a new idea. I don't know the exact time, but I believe it's early 1980s that these were envisioned. Um, and even things like, uh, you probably know the term GRU or LSTM. My understanding is even an LSTM was envisioned in the 80s, although maybe I'm wrong and it's the 90s. But it was certainly a long time ago, even though these are still considered relatively cutting edge, exciting new technologies. Uh, what's really exciting is A, we've developed much more of an art as to how to fit these. You know, how do we initialize these things? What does backpropagation look like? And of course, much more exciting is that we've all got now fancy GPUs and things that can actually chug through this, right? So the ability to imagine something, this was there in the 60s, right? But the ability to actually do it is what's fairly new. And also the presence of enough data to get good results is fairly new. Uh, so the, the two variants of recurrent neural networks that have turned out to be quite successful, one is called a GRU. So you see an example here. So uh, what we're looking at now is if we were to actually unpack the guts of this thing. So if we unpack the guts, uh, this is what we've got. We've, we've got our, our XT that comes in. We track our hidden states. It goes through several different um, variants of transformation. And people have sort of like the update gate, the forget gate. The idea is, is you have different components. One is sort of supposed to help the model to decide how much it should sort of update its hidden state based on new information. Another sort of looks at the new information com coming in and sort of transforms it before it even sort of talks to the hidden state. And so you have all these parameters that can sort of specialize to describe different, um, different properties of the temporal dynamics of your data, depending on how they allow the updating. Now, the interesting thing is, in a way, this sounds a bit like what we talked about with structural time series and state space models generally, right? It is developing some sort of internal model, just like the common filter, of how it should adapt to new information given its prior expectations. Although, in this case, its prior expectations are a hidden state that is not sort of a well-described statistical thing. It's more like a set of uh, parameters in a matrix. Um, and actually, the, the theory of this is not as well developed as I'm sure it will be you know, in a decade from now. And we'll eventually figure out, you know, these are, these are still models. They can still have statistical properties. It's just so much harder to think about them. But that's what a GRU is. Uh, a GRU versus an LSTM, you've probably heard of these too. An LSTM tends to be a little bit more complicated. It has one more gate compared to a GRU. In many cases, it doesn't perform any better. But it's sort of worth looking at both of them, depending on your data set. Uh, LSTM, people say, has sort of a longer memory compared to a GRU, but again, depends very much on what kind of data you're looking at. OK, so convolutional neural networks. You might be surprised to see this here because you're thinking, oh, I heard RNNs are actually um, RNNs are time aware. But actually, CNNs can also be time aware in the sense that an image is very much like some of the things we've done today, right? Such as Time series classification, time series clustering does not look all that different from image analysis, right? So we can also use convolutional neural networks as a way of understanding our time series as a picture. That can be on its own already a good way to classify a time series. We can also do modifications to convolutional neural networks that make them temporally aware. So one example of that is what's called a causal convolution. So in a standard convolution, if you do image analysis, it sort of treats all directions as the same and all areas are equally spaced. But you can do a very easy modification, a causal convolution, where convolution sort of only goes in one direction temporally. And in that case, you have convolution that is also time aware. That can be used as an input to other components of a model, or it can just be its own model. Um, which of these performs better will very much depend on your data, what kind of patterns are in your data, and what kind of task you're trying to do. Are you trying to predict, or are you trying to classify? Um, CNNs tend to be more successful for time series classification rather than prediction, but of course, that's just a very broad generalization in a field where we're still sort of working out the science of how these things work. Uh, and so one actually really cool architecture I wanted to highlight, this was published about two years ago, I think, LSTNet. Um, so these researchers actually said, well, why, why do we have to pick and choose between convolutional and recurrent behaviors? There's actually no reason we shouldn't use both. And in a way, that makes sense, right? Because if we think about something like the airline passengers data, there's sort of both aspects, right? There's this sort of aspect of we see a trend and a difference. And that's sort of more like RNN-ish, right, to see a trend. I'm not sure convolutional understands that. But on the other hand, we have this seasonal component 
right, where there's sort of winter, fall, summer, et cetera, et cetera. And that part seems a bit more like an image analysis type of um, component, right? So they had this idea. They also said, we can use the convolutional bit to understand better how to use multivariate time series, right? So to the extent we want to relate different inputs, right? If I have different inputs into my model and it's not just a univariate time series, do I want to sort of convolve these? There are a few advantages to that. One is maybe you'll discover there are relationships between them, especially if we convolve on time and input, right? And we sort of take almost like a sliding window image of our time series. Um, but we can also think maybe the convolution itself might identify some seasonality, right? Because that's sort of image-like. They also said, well, why do we always do sort of recurrent where we just sort of feed it in one at a time? What we might also want to do to design our architecture to better reflect certain realities is we might want to have something that reflects the reality of seasonality. So we might also want to have something where we skip, right? So maybe if I have 24-hour data, I might want to have both an RNN that looks at all the hours, but I might want to have an RNN that in addition to looking at all the hours, only looks at the same local hour for previous day, right? So if I'm at 3 a.m. trying to predict the electricity for 4 a.m., maybe I want to look at 1, 2, 3, 4, or, you know, 0, whatever, up to 3 a.m., you know, that sort of slice, but I might want to look at 3 a.m. from the previous day and the previous day and previous day and think of that as its own time series and have a recurrent neural network that runs only through that, or if not that, maybe only look at the states of the recurrent neural network at those points, right? Uh, so for those of you who have worked with uh, neural networks, you know that there's actually sort of infinite architectural permutations you can make. Anything you can imagine, you can build in a fairly straightforward way, although figuring out how to train it properly, of course, is always where you run into trouble and figuring out if you actually have enough data to train it. Uh, but the, the wonderful thing about this as compared to some of the other models we've looked at today is you can imagine any sort of dynamics and describe it with some kind of neural network and, and see if you can improve your uh, forecasting or classification or what have you. Uh, uh, so that, that is prediction. So let's see if I can get my... Uh, hopefully it will come back up. Okay, so in the meantime, I would ask everyone to open your notebooks. So we're going to look at uh, notebook five. <coughs> This is supposed to come back on. Uh, electricity. Okay, I'm going to see if I can, oh, excellent, thank goodness. Okay, remind me not to move at all until for the next 13 minutes. Okay, so we're going to try to forecast electricity. This is one of the original data sets that was used when the LSTNet model was published. So the LSTNet model, when it was published, they saw um, pretty big gains compared to, say, something like just using a GRU or just using a convolutional neural network. And they made this point of, you know, building a, a, an architecture that reflects especially sort of the temporal cadences of human activity um, works really well. And also, they were making the point that with multivariate time series, it can be interesting to find ways to combine those information channels. So those, those were what they pointed out. So one of the model, one of the data sets they used with this was this electric data set that we're going to use now. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is look at the data. Let's look at this together. So if we read it in and look at the head, as you can see, this is like very multi-channel. This is 321 parallel time series of electric use, hourly electric use, at 321 different sites. Um, I want to say it's the state of Alabama, but I don't remember. You'd have to check the reference uh, to the data they do mention. But it's hourly times, hourly electric use in some state in the US. Um, and if we plot this, as always, there are you know sort of better and worse ways to plot. But if we look, this, this is really interesting, right? This is just that one site for the full range of time, it's interesting to me because you have sort of drastically different regimes. Uh, so if I were doing, say, a traditional statistical model or even a machine learning model, I would be really hard pressed to think, oh my goodness, like how am I going to make all of these different points in time comparable, right? I mean, this, this looks really different and it would, it would take a lot of thought, whereas with a neural network, sometimes because we don't, for now, have those assumptions built in, we can also expect it to more flexibly handle really varying data and maybe even notice things that we wouldn't notice. 
Uh, but this, this long-term plot, this gives us one view. It tells us that we've gone through sort of different regimes of electric use at this one site, and this is just one of 321 inputs. Um, and unless I were doing this as a full-time job for years, I'm not sure I'd be able to look at all 321 and know them, although great if you can, right? Um, but also, let's remember, if we look at it at a smaller time scale, we'll spot other data. So if we look at it at this smaller time scale, what we spot is some kind of recurring pattern, right? Which makes sense because this is hourly electric use. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, I would have expected to see better use than this, and this is because we have, I have pre-differenced this data for you. So actually the original paper fit to the original time series, which looks more like the air passengers, it's sort of a count. Um, but A, that's too easy, and B, that tends to over-represent how well you're doing. You're like, oh man, look at me, I got 99% correlation, they match so well when in fact most of that could just be done with a null model. So if we difference it out, we are being really strict with ourselves that like the model has to add something useful that can predict from hour to hour, rather than just sort of globally getting it right. So I encourage you whenever you can to use differenced data. Um, okay, so handy data structure. This is not, nothing to do with time series, but I like to use something like a ring buffer when I'm sort of thinking about a way to do early stopping. Uh, so another thing for those new to neural networks, there's no sort of predefined limit to how long you should train, right? You sort of want to train as long as you're getting better, but you want to make sure you don't overfit. So that's similar to other techniques we've discussed today. The difference being is that now we could potentially have way more parameters than even the most complicated model we've looked at, right? We talked about how structural time series, there's so many knobs to turn, looks like you could really game it if you wanted to. That is like orders of magnitude different from this. This is really a lot of knobs to turn, so we need to make sure to be disciplined in our fitting. So um, that's just one way that I did early stopping. Okay, so data preparation. I want to call your attention to this because this part actually looks a little bit like what we had done before, right? Where we take one long time series and we reshape it into many slices of a time series. Um, in this case, we have multi-channel. So we're not just um, slicing along one axis. We actually have to slice all of our multivariate time series and make sure that all of them sort of are these sliding windows and keep them in sync. So that's what this data does. I would um, encourage you to look at it on your own as well to see how that works. We also build uh, data iterators so that we can prepare batches of data. Okay, so here's the interesting part. Um, so I provide examples of how you could use a fully connected model or a CNN model. I would encourage you to try those out on your own. You'll find that they don't tend to do as well as the RNN model or the simple LSTNet model that I've introduced here. So um, just briefly, the RNN model, how do you build an RNN model in MixNet? Well, you need to have a cell, and then you need to add that cell. You decide how many hidden units you have, which is basically saying how large of like a hidden state matrix do I want to have, right? Like how many different parameters do I want to have to describe this behavior of how it should update and how it should retain information? So uh, with an RNN model, that's essentially just one layer of this RNN rollout that we did already. Now let's look at this LSTNet model. This is um, really interesting, and this corresponds to that architecture I showed you. Uh, the first thing we're going to do in this case is we're going to apply a convolutional filter to our inputs. So we're going to take our inputs, which is multi-channel, right? So actually in this case, um, we have time by batch number um, by TNC, time by batch number by channel, where channels is like 320, right? Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is run that through a filter where we're basically like looking at a sliding window as an image. So the window slides both over time but also over all of our features. We then take the convolutional output and that becomes the input to our neural network RNN, the recurrent neural network. So in this case we've said instead of just feeding in our raw values, we could also consider um, processing those with other neural components. It's almost a way of saying the convolutional component is going to produce features from our raw features. It's going to boil those down to fewer features. And then those features are going to go into the recurrent bits. So we're sort of divvying up the task. We're not going to do the feature generation, but some portion of our network is going to do the feature generation before we feed it into the recurrent neural network. And if you think about that, that makes sense, right? Because why should I be putting in 320 parallel measurements into the recurrent neural network, which then A has to decide how the measurements are related to each other and how they're interesting, but B has to keep track of the temporal components. So if I can um, sort of shrink down the multivariate aspects so that the RNN can concentrate on the temporal component, that can be really helpful. Now there are two RNN um, 
there are two RNN models, right? There's um, one that sort of looks at every data point, and then there's one that sort of skips seasonality. Um, but here I have left that out, and I just have the regular RNN. And the reason for that was I just found that for this particular data set, it wasn't especially important. So that's something else you want to keep in mind, is what architecture actually improves your process for a particular model. And then finally, what I didn't mention, but what's really interesting, is the authors included an autoregressive element. This is just an element that uses the past values to predict future values, right? This is the same as an ARIMA model. So actually what we're seeing here also is combining um, a statistical approach with neural networks. And this is something that is increasingly common and that has actually proven quite successful in time series in particular, much more than in other areas of machine learning. So those are our models. Uh, we can define our training and we can run this. Let's see, am I running? My screen is, well, my screen is frozen, so we must be running because uh, that's what happens on my rinky-dink laptop. Um, obviously, you don't usually really want to do deep learning on a laptop, and you don't usually want to do it on a, on a small data set, so keeping both of those in mind. Um, let's see. Okay, well, I, I would encourage you to uh, check out the output and experiment with this on your own, but the, the punchline that I, I wish we had time to train on is that um, the LSTNet model does quite a bit better than the recurrent neural network alone. Uh, so it's really important to design structures that are like savvy about how they allocate uh, the labor. So in this case, the labor of the convolutional bit, the feature generation, is separated out from the temporal analysis. That's one thing that makes this model really successful. The other thing that makes this model really successful is the inclusion of this AR component, the autoregressive component. And in fact, if you remove that component, you take an enormous hit to performance. Um, so this, is, I think, is great inspiration for how you can take your traditional statistical knowledge and work it into your neural networks. And you will find that that gets you a really great outcome. Um, and in fact, so most recently, there was an academic research competition on, uh, machine, on, on time series forecasting. And both the number one and number two winners of this competition, which took place on 100,000 different time series over many domains, turned out to be integrating machine learning and statistical, uh, statistical analyses that are quite traditional. In one case, combining statistical analyses with uh, deep learning, and then another case using XGBoost to choose the coefficients to combine statistical models. Uh, so also the ways that you can sort of permute these things are uh, quite varied. Gosh. I could have sworn this, this ran faster when I was, oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, so in, in this case, you can see I'm printing out the correlation. Um, which metric you like can be a matter of personal preference. It can also be a matter of what is meaningful for your problem. Uh, but basically what we wanna see here is that it's improving, especially on the validation. I think we will stop it here if we can. Yes, okay. So stopped it here. I also have the results from the last time I uh, ran this already loaded. No. No, I'm lying. Oh, I see, because I only went up to, okay, let's do this. Okay, so in, in this case, we can see what we're looking at um, after only four iterations, and we can see so far for this uh, first column, it doesn't look especially fantastic. Let's look at this column. Uh, quite different, right? And this, this actually looks a little bit more promising, especially if we ignore outliers. Uh, but we can see here that we've actually managed to fit many time series, right? We're fitting 321 time series um, in parallel with one generalized model. And so we can sort of expect results to vary between one and the other. So if you let this go for about um, 20 to 25 iterations, you get really excellent results, um, but not after, after five epochs. So I'd encourage you to keep this running on your own computers. Uh, but takeaways here are, this is not even an enormous time series uh, data set, right? I can fit this all in memory on my rinky-dink laptop. So um, 
I actually, in my experience, have found that deep learning works even better than like sort of uh, regression trees and things like that for cases of small-ish but not tiny data sets for um, deep learning compared to statistical models. And also that you want to be creative about combining your statistical models and your uh, deep learning. So this is where you see, especially for time series analysis, having a broad domain knowledge of many different sort of classes of analysis will also help you to build more creative models. So even when you want to do something more cutting edge like deep learning, um, having that traditional knowledge will really help you. OK, so I have one slide to wrap up because I did want to talk about. OK, so just to wrap up to, uh, to highlight some things that we haven't talked about but that are important also as being on the horizon or just active areas in modern time series analysis, I think the huge one that we didn't have time for uh, but that you can very much address with what we talked about today is anomaly detection, right? So maybe even some of you work in this field. Um, things like structural time series, hidden Markov models, uh, regression trees, XGBoost, and deep learning can all be applied to the question of anomaly detection. So anomaly detection is not something where you need one specific technique. Actually, all of these are available to you and may even be combined successfully. Um, there's also so many new and old libraries for time series analysis, especially for more modern methods. There are literally hundreds of packages. Um, definitely, this is an environment where R's options are richer than Python, so you might also want to get more comfortable, especially like with uh, at least being able to access R packages through Python to have access to those. Um, time series analysis obviously is an area of active research, both in industry and in academia, but most people who are doing cutting edge research work in R, so I'm a bit of a downer on that front, that if you want to have access to those methods, you also want to be uh, looking at the R ecosystem as well as the Python ecosystem. And then the two things I would highlight that we didn't talk about, but you would also want to look into, firstly is automated forecasting at scale. So somebody had brought up Facebook's profit package. There's also a Google package. There's also a Twitter package. I'm probably forgetting some others, but uh, there are some massive tech companies, Uber, um, looking at really massive data sets of time series, developing ideas for their own research, and then sometimes either open sourcing them or sometimes offering forecasting as a service. So an example of that is Amazon now offers, uh, via AWS, is offering forecasting as a service um, using sort of their expertise at their, at their own data, right? So if you, you have data that looks like Amazon's data, right, like many, many parallel time series or highly variable time series such as rolling out new products, you might want to look into that. Um, the extent to which they are open about what they're doing versus a little bit cagey varies by company. So some of these packages are completely open source. Some of them are completely closed off. What is clear when you read the literature um, is they're barely using deep learning. It's primarily um, traditional ARIMA or traditional models that have few parameters because the goal for them is to just have a fairly reliable, transparent forecast rather than the perfect forecast. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, to some extent, it looks like the future is combining machine learning and statistical approaches, so you very much do still want to have that traditional time series forecasting background and ARIMA and that sort of thing, because that is not going away, and it continues to be part of even the most cutting edge uh, results in time series analysis. Okay, uh, so I'm available for questions afterwards. Thanks very much for coming to the tutorial, and please be in touch if you have questions or comments. <laughs>